Hey, man. This guy's like awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know, like, that he is, he is South Central Pennsylvania's premier fisherman? Did you guys know? No, no seriously, fish tremble at the mention of Dan <laughs> Roller's name. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did, didn't you? <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. Get out your, uh, get out your little. It's a rice wafer. <laughs> hey man, I got that established. It took me. This is. A, it took me a whole school to get over that. This little thing here, <laughs> didn't it, Becky? I was like. <laughs> well, we're gonna receive communion. It's Monday. Hi, Jessalyn. You're awesome. Jesus loves you. He thinks you're great. We're going to receive communion. And I want to encourage you. You know, the Bible says as often as you do it. You don't have to wait for a church service. And uh, this can sound offensive to some folks, but I'm in the school and people are hooked up online and I think everybody will relate and understand. There's some people that believe this becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus, and, and, and I think that's incredible that, that people believe that. I heard Randy Clark once say, I'm just, I wish I could believe that. He said, that's beautiful. And, yeah, so it's not something to debate over. One thing I do know is it's remembering what he did and accomplished until he comes. That I know. So, and... and uh, I tell people, man, if, if, if it's just a contact point of faith to you, you can be getting breakfast out. You could be pouring the Cheerios. You could pull one out of the bowl. It's just a contact point of faith. You pull one out of the bowl and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the body that was broken. You snap the thing. It's just a contact point of faith. You could do that without elements. You could just get up with a Christ consciousness, the gospel finished work consciousness. So this, this just really points you in that direction. You see what I'm saying? So just hear clear what I'm saying and, and, and then there's, it's just a heart thing. It's, but you could do that wherever you are. There was a season in my life where I received communion every day till it seemed like, you know, that season was, was past and then you still do it as often as you do. You're still in that place. But, but every day till the, what the accomplishment of the body and the blood was to me, to my own heart, to my own life, got really, really big. You follow what I'm saying? And it wasn't just head knowledge because I was receiving it with him alone when you weren't there. And it's communion. Communion. I was, right? I was coming into union with the finished work of Christ. I was having fellowship with what he accomplished. So I would, Father, I just thank you. You sent your son. And I would just, it was this. And boom, boom. And I did that every day for a long time. I won't put a time limit on it. I just did it every day for a long time. And the, the revelation of the body got really, really big. And I remember it being 40, 45 minutes before I ever put it in my mouth. And I thought, man, if I keep doing this, I'm going to have to get up at like 4 in the morning to receive communion. Because <laughs> i got to get into the office. <laughs> because it would take me 40, 45 minutes to just put this in my mouth because it got so big. It was so powerful. And scriptures. And, and then, then I'd take the blood and then... It's like you're starting almost all over again in a sense of another element of the body accomplished something, the blood accomplished something. And it would just bring me into a place of just oneness and unity with Him. Uh, another aspect of communion is all that is mine is yours and all that is yours is mine. You didn't hold anything back. You gave me your whole self. There was nothing you held back. You gave your body, your blood that I could have life. And if I come after you, I deny myself, pick up my cross and follow, you gave everything. And then there's a committal, there's a place of giving yourself. Water baptism has that same connotation. It's, you always want to throw that in there because that's a good heart commitment place. Amen? So what do you say we receive communion? You ready? Y'all awake? Y'all good? Okay. Pastor Don and I are. We're early guys. <laughs> Lori is, Pastor Lori is, because we're taking communion and she likes it. <laughs> She's like, can we do it Tuesday? <laughs> you ready? Just get personal right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead in a minute, but right now I want you to just take about 30, 40, 50 seconds, a minute, and just thank God for Jesus, for the body. And just begin to reflect on whatever you know about the body right now in your heart. 
just just hold that and just thank Jesus he really did come he was beat he was bruised he gave his flesh surrendered sacrificed put himself on the cross faced and conquered death so you never have to die he was separated from the father so you could forever be joined with him just think about that it's amazing just thank him right now for the body if you're online, if you're on, on online, man, get some elements. If you don't have elements close by, right now, if you're online, just begin to reflect on the body of Jesus Christ. Just begin to thank God that He died for you, because He loves you, because your life's worth living, because He sees value to your destiny and to your purpose. And you made it possible. One died that all could live. You were the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Your innocence was given and yielded up so that my guilt could be removed away. It's amazing. You raised literally from the dead in this body. You came up with a brand new body. You came up raised from the dead, firstborn from the dead, firstborn among many. <coughs> and when you raised, I was justified. I was made clean and pure and right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have every right to life because you live. It's good. I hear a lot of whispering out there, a lot of prayer. And just, just begin to talk and thank Him. Get personal about the body. Even if it's two things, one or two things that are real to you that, that you know He accomplished in His body. <coughs> See, He was beat beyond description. You couldn't even tell who He was when they were done beating Him. He yielded His flesh to the place of being undescribable, unrecognizable. That's amazing. They beat Him and beat Him. He was marred more than any of the sons of men. You've heard me preach that before. The revelation came to me that when sin got done with Adam and Eve in the garden, they didn't look anything like they were created to be. They lost their appearance. They lost the glory of God. They lost the image of God. Jesus came and was beat beyond recognition and lost his recognizableness, if that's a word, so that we could be restored back to what we looked like in the first place. That's incredible to me. That's the stuff Holy Spirit will teach you and show you when you stop, look, and listen, and take time. Because you wonder, why did it have to be so brutal? Because sin was so brutal. And we all died through one man's disobedience, but much more. <laughs> much more. See, what Jesus did so crushed sin and the effects of sin, much more through one man's obedience. We're all made righteous. Father, we just hold this up and we thank you for the body of Jesus Christ. We've taken time. We've pondered in our hearts. We've personally thanked you and we've appreciated the sacrifice. Let it grow in revelation and understanding and even in appreciation. Let our eyes and our understanding see what Jesus accomplished more than ever before. And as we enter into this communion time and even this school and as we go on and on, we just dedicate this time to you and we say, even as you gave all that you are, the best we understand, we give all that we are to know you and to become more like you, to manifest you by the Spirit of God. So we take this and we thank you that we're in covenant. And all that is yours is ours. And all that is ours is yours. And we thank you for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take your little cup. Just thank Him for the blood. Most of us know for sure that the blood was shed to forgive us of all sin. Every act of sin ever committed. When the body, when you're taking that body, you know, the blood was shed to forgive the act of sin. The body was given to remove the effects of sin. Where's the effects of sin reside? Usually in the body, somewhere in the soul, in the mind, in the, in, in the flesh. So Jesus was made to be sin and everything that sin was and brought was put on him so it could be taken off of us he cursed sin in the flesh by making his son sin on the cross hanging on a pole anything hanging on a pole cursed by God and sin shall have no dominion over us you are not under the dominion of sin righteousness rules and reigns in our hearts amen and we've been talking about it for all week long so take this blood and thank God you're absolutely forgiven that sin has lost its power, death has lost its sting, 
that you are not ruled by yesterday, the past, mistakes, failures. You stand in the presence of God because of the accomplishment and finished work of Jesus Christ. You have a high priest who's passed through the heavens and you have access to the Father. You can receive His love, His grace, His mercy, His power. You stand righteous because of the blood that was shed. The blood's on the mercy seat in the holy heavenly tabernacle in heaven. And it speaks mercy over your life. You go free. That's amazing. Just thank Him right now. Take 20, 30 seconds. Thank Him for the blood for your own life. Thank God that He loves you. He forgives you. He made you completely clean, completely pure. Thank Him that you're spotless. (laughs) Thank Him that you're holy and blameless and above reproach. That's blasphemy, brother. No, it's Colossians chapter 1. Thank you for your word, God. Your word was made flesh. You came. You dwelt among us. You manifested who you are and who we're called to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood that was shed that made us right. That revealed to us so much that we're learning and growing in. We honor you. We receive the blood right now of Jesus Christ. And we stand clean and righteous because of your goodness and your justice. In Jesus' name. Mm-hmm. Thanks, God. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Is that good or what? Can I use your table? I didn't take that. Like you could take that in a church setting and you could could preach that out and stir that up and take that corporately. I took my time. I I stayed real kind of low-key actually because I want us to learn when we're alone to activate our heart and just get real. You and God. Amen? We're always being led into things and following. And it's just real good to take time. And I don't care if it's quiet. I don't care if it you know, doesn't seem like... I'm not looking at in the school, especially taking communion like that, just for the corporate setting as much as your heart's responding to God at some level. Some people have a more of a capacity to respond at a bigger level than others. Some just have one or two thoughts that are becoming alive to them. You camp there until they live in you and then another one will grow. You see what I'm saying? See, I don't want to know the whole Bible. I don't want to know the Word. I want to become that Word. I want to, I want to, beca- I want to read that and go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? I don't want to just read it so I can quote it. And then at the coffee table, you know, we're out there and, and we're having a spiritual conversation. I feel like I'm in the conversation because I know what the Bible says. No, I want to become that. I told you last week about the crossroads Christianity thing and just becoming the word and not having a fork in the road and a lot of multiple choice and options. And that's one reason we're doing this school so that we can be rooted and grounded in love and formed in Christ by the Spirit of God, okay? So this is really, really important. Have some things we want to cover today. Uh, I'm going to do this real quick. I'm, we're, all, there's, there's a lot of questions always that come up. There's been a handful in the class. There's a lot of people online, so there's a few. I'm not going to answer all the questions online from the classroom setting, but I'm going to do the ones that I feel like have a corporate, uh, 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 corporate blessing to that we can all get something from it. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I, I, and, and this is a good one right here. So I'm just going to hit a couple of these questions real quick. This is from a girl named... This is from Mandy. And she'll know who she is. Mandy, we're going to answer your question the best we can right now. And then we're going to pray for you, kiddo. With all our hearts. And expect God to come and do something beautiful. She's understanding this whole identity thing and the whole thing. She said, the thing is I have diabetes. A lot of symptoms. And it's been for years. For 14 years. And she's only 27. So... She said, I hate this disease. And, you know, I'm thinking lifestyle in Christ, but this thing becomes your lifestyle. And I've often heard people say diabetes isn't a disease, it's a lifestyle. Because you have to get used to living with it and dealing with it. And there's a reality of what she's saying. And I know a lot of times you can get spiritual and Christian mind and go, no. No, what she's asking is, I've been prayed for. I've been getting up. I want to live in Christ, but I have this thing called diabetes. Now, we're going to pray for Mandy in a moment, but I want to explain this. There's a lot of things like that in people's lives that are sincere and grown in Christ and they have physical things that are trying to hold them back or certain mental things, different things. Who knows what I'm saying? It's true. And you can let that identify you easily. You can let what you're going through become who you are because it's real. It has ramifications to it. It has feelings. It has setbacks. It has hindrances. 
the key is this, and even, even sickness, just simple just symptoms and sickness, some people get so identified by it that they feel like if I'm feeling that, I can't pray for the sick because I'm sick. And that, why? Because you're taking on the identity of that sickness and now you're disqualified to even move by the Spirit. You're not seeing yourself for, for the Spirit, you're seeing yourself for what you're going through. So you're disqualifying yourself from even praying for the sick. I tell people the greatest thing you can do, one of the most exciting things you can do is go pray for the sick if you're not feeling that good. And you've been pursuing God and there's things coming on you and a friend prayed for you and you're still feeling bad. Don't walk by a sick person. Man, because when you go pray for them, it's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, again, let me say this, I said it last week. Hypocrisy is wearing a mask. Hypocrisy is play acting. Hypocrisy isn't praying for the sick when you have sickness in your body. Because people use that word all the time and say, well, that would make me feel like a hypocrite. Why? You're saying, look, I know it's not by my experience, but the word's way above my experience, and I haven't felt healing in my body yet, but God said he loves us and heals us, and I believe it, and that's why I'm praying for you, and this thing is going to happen. Do you get what I'm saying? Or you're, or you're just going to, you know, sell short and say, well, I feel like a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a play actor. It's saying one thing and meaning another. It's saying I love you and not loving you at all. <laughs> it's, it's just fitting in. It's playing a part to get something to whatever. Hypocrisy isn't you praying for the sick if you're struggling with sickness. That's actually faith in saying, you know what, I believe the Word of God above what I'm experiencing right now and none of this is going to eat my lunch because Jesus is Lord and I'm pressing in. Do you get what we're saying? So you pray for the sick even if you have sickness. But if you have a situation like this, the greatest thing you can do, if you have an ongoing symptom, an ongoing sickness, if you're, if you're going through, just say you have a ruptured disc and friends have been praying for you and it really hurts and you get up in the morning and it's just hard to get by and you've got a pulsating pain and, and here's the temptation. Your mind wants to get hit by a thousand questions. Well, why am I here? Well, why is this happening? Well, if God, then how come? And why? And none of that builds you in relationship. None of that takes the ruptured disc away. It just struggles your mind, confuses your head and troubles your heart <laughs> you're rooted and grounded in love okay I, I tell some testimonies of a few things I've been through I've only been through a few things and 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 they've been serious and they tried to eat my lunch for a little and if I didn't have what I'm telling you down and understood I was scrambled groped grabbed struggled and sold out my identity four or five times along the way you know what I'm saying no you're rooted and grounded in love bottom line is God loves me period we've settled that because he died on the cross his love is not challenged in question because I'm going through an experience in my flesh his love shouldn't be challenged by that that's not the question well if God loves me how come I'm still going through this please throw away the right to even ask that question if God didn't love you he'd have never put Jesus on the cross we're in a spiritual war we're growing we're learning we're getting healed and saved and set free even in our soul our mind and our emotions and that's where the battle is anyway there's two places I could show you in the Bible and we might cover it where it talks about the salvation of your soul well, your spirit saved and born again, but your soul, your mind, and your emotions is what's being redeemed from the fall as you grow up in Christ. You're starting to think like God thinks, feel like God feels. Well, that's got to be awesome, right? See the salvation of your soul because you tempt to get in to throw in to get little uh, things of fear, little things of self-consciousness, little things of, of just home high, and seeing things for the flesh, for the natural. Who knows that's the way we were trained our whole life to live. So the salvation of your soul is always coupled. The two times that the phrase is specifically mentioned, it's in Hebrews 10, end of the chapter, and it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, about verse 9. Both times the specific phrase salvation of your soul is used, it has to do with believing and stepping forward. Why? Because you're not living by what you see. You're not living central like we covered all last week. You're living by faith. And the end result of your faith, 1 Peter chapter 1, I believe it's verse 9. The, the, the end result of your faith is the salvation of your soul. So the consummation, the finished work of your faith is the healing, delivering, setting free, and making whole of your mind and emotions. Well, isn't that the thing that goes bonkers on people? <laughs> ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, right? That's what we do. That's not faith. <laughs> you see what I mean? So here's the deal. So you have a condition, a physical condition, and, and it's ongoing. 
And, and a week goes by, and now it's two weeks. And your mind says, well, it's two weeks. This is natural knowledge. This is human reasoning. I don't suggest you live there. Two weeks goes by, and the easiest thing to think is, well, it's two weeks. If I was doing things right, I, well, this would be going by now, and I wonder what, and I must be. And then you start groping and going down all these roads and looking for answers. And I just promise you, receiving the love of God and being rooted and grounded in love and not letting your heart and mind shift and switch is the greatest thing you can do. You wake up and even if that pain, I've been through this a few times, I don't have to get into the stories where I literally thought I was going to die. And I had people, the best thing that most people could say to me was, yeah, but Dan, this don't make sense. If you understand righteousness, how come it's touching you in the first place? So it's this contradictory question that's not even producing life. It's more of a contest. And we reserve, we reserve the right in human intellect to even ask those questions. Are you kidding? I don't know. I can't even answer that question. I just know I'm in a war and Jesus is Lord and He loves me and lives in my spirit and my flesh is going to say yes, sir, in a minute here. Amen. There you, go. you see, that's all I can tell you. I don't have any other answers. Like Pastor was preaching yesterday. He says, yep. <laughs> There's times, you know, you can't answer. People say, well, this and this. Yep. <laughs> you know? So, so, so that's, I can't answer that. But I know, I know when I wake up and I can't walk or I'm in so much pain, that I never give that the right to decide and determine who God is. I always let who God is have the right to determine this by staying here and receiving love and Father you love me pain in your body Father I thank you your blood sugar not lined up and symptoms of diabetes eyesight failing a little bit some neuropathy and all those feelings in your flesh and you've been prayed for by a, a bunch of people that you know are spirit filled and all of a sudden nothing's changed your mind tends to say boy if God wanted to heal me he'd heal me by now that's what the church does then we create theology based on what is and isn't happening and now we answer the thing and write a new book <laughs> <sighs> or all kinds of stuff or well if you had faith honey you'd be healed by now well you need to go clean up you must have some garbage in your life or something I know a lady called my house crying one time filled with Holy Spirit parked along the road in a van in North Carolina crying praying in tongues called me on the phone overwhelmed trying to talk and she's crying and she had the number that's when my dear friend Dr. John was handing out all those CDs with my phone number on <laughs> And uh, <laughs> she, she, she's in North Carolina driving in a van and somebody handed her the CD and she had it in and she didn't read really, she just popped it in. She's hurting, she's, she's kind of disheartened, not kind of, she is disheartened. She's been in the church three years and they told her if you, when you get yourself right and clean and you become a clean vessel, you can receive Holy Spirit and you'll be able to pray in tongues. So for three years, she hasn't prayed in tongues. They prayed over her, and now the more time goes by, the dirtier she feels. Well, I must be a real dirty vessel. Well, if I ain't got clean by now, I ain't, there's something wrong. I got a lot of stain in my life. He doesn't even want, he disdains me. I got so much stain, he doesn't even come sit in me. You know, she's driving the van. She starts hearing how she's loved. She's hearing a CD. It's, it's a righteousness CD. It's where I was pulling all the pedals. He loves me, loves me, loves me. She's, and she's like, oh my God you do love me because she wants to believe that but she's being told that if if she was lovable he'd be in her and she'd be filled with the spirit and all that and see it's just it's just misteaching but it cripples people's identity so she lost three years in wrong identity feeling the more she went to church the more dirty she felt now, that's a tragedy she's listening to one cd on a back road in Carolinas, north or south, I don't remember where. I just know she was crying and it was fun and I was home and I heard her there crying on my machine. I picked up and I didn't know at first if she was even okay and I realized she was very okay. But, but she was, here's what happened. She's driving in the van. It's faith. It's not intellect. It's heart. She said, oh my God, you do love me. There's nothing wrong with me. Well, I was yet a sinner. You've loved me. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit of God just but 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 what happened? She, her soul got free. She said, None of this is the thing going on. What was happening? She just you love me. I'm special to you. I'm worth the blood of Jesus to you, God the Father. You see something so valuable in me. That's what Christians don't do. They wait to prove that or something. Jesus proved that. 
Do you get what I'm saying? Sickness is the same way. You start identifying with the thing that's not quite in line or in order, and it starts marking you. And that's your biggest challenge when you're going through something like that because it wants to try to get in. And that's why we really got to get free from self-consciousness, self-centeredness stuff. Even though this thing is real, I'm not talking insensitive now, bear with me. Even though this thing is real, you have to be careful to not let it become who you are because who you are is in Christ, period. So that's your fighting point. You wake up in the morning, Father, I'm in you, you love me. I'm telling you, you could have numb fingertips and neuropathy in your toes. Father, you love me, and I am blessed, and your spirit is upon me. Father, your favor is towards me. And I just thank you for the blessing of this gospel upon my flesh. Thank you for life in my body. Father, I know that my life's worth living, that your mark is upon me. You love me, because the blood of Jesus was shed. And you just keep going like this. You love me. You see what I mean? Because as time goes on, this thing, oh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, I, I'm telling you, all we know is this. We're growing up into Him in all things, and all these other things are going to iron out and make sense. We're not going to look back. We're not going to draw back. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not you don't have enough faith, or you're doing something wrong, we've got to hit it. Because if there's a thing like that that would seem to be empowering this thing, if I'm doing this in relationship and he loves me and I'm growing in that, who knows, as a father, he's going to nurture me and, and open that up. And honestly, it's funny, these thoughts were on me coming down the Eastburn Road to pick up Destiny this morning. I was like, you know, we give that stuff so much power and we're saved by grace through faith and the best we know, our hearts are sincere and we love God and want to do right. It's, we're not subject to all this craziness. Like people think, there's not some, some crazy thing behind the scenes binding up our life when I'm sincere like a child and just want Jesus. Yeah. I just want Jesus. And now you're making it really difficult in your theology thinking that all these other glitches are in the way. No, I just want Jesus. And I'm not going to let any rational mindset keep me from him. So I don't have a grid for all that stuff having power and being in the way. I really don't. You're not going to stop this thing now. He's coming. I'm here. Yay. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? It's just not that technical and difficult. But if you believe it is, you're going to get weird and mystical on some thinking that doesn't... When I say weird, I'm not being insulted. What I mean is outside of simplicity, complex is a better word. You're going to stretch truth outside the parameters of truth and start making things have power. I believe that. You, you have what you believe in the gospel. If it's simple, if it's simplicity, <laughs> if it's simplicity, this is not going to be deep. <laughs> then it's simple. <laughs> See, I didn't have to go to seminary for that one. <laughs> Come on. I'm concerned for you that like Eve was deceived by the serpent, you too have been removed from the simplicity that's in Christ. This thing is simple. I was lost, he came, he died, set me free, put all that he is in me, gave me his kingdom, yea, I'm free. I'm out of darkness, into light, sanctified, kingdom of the son of his love. I was lost, I'm found, I had no covenant, now I do. God was estranged, now I'm not, yea, I'm in. <laughs> I was guilty, I was all that stuff, and now I'm free. I'm delivered from the power of darkness. It's in Colossians. Yeah, I would, I would ringtone that one too. Yeah! I'm delivered from the... Her phone couldn't even take it. You ought to get it. Her phone went, yeah! Serious! Come on. Are we believing? Or are we feeling? See? I have been delivered. I'm telling you, oh, they see how passionate this is in me. I'm trying to play a chord. It doesn't last long. <laughs> there is so much talk about deliverance and needing delivered and needing delivered. It's because we don't believe we are. And then everything that we're afraid of and vulnerable to says, ah, and grabs you and chokes you and holds you. 
You're okay. This is gonna sound arrogant. You're not choking me. You're not holding me. You don't even have a right to me. I'm filled with the Spirit of God and I'm righteous. My heart is pure. Now, if I violate my conscience, I start living in secret sin. I look in the mirror and see less than Christ sees. Then I start feeling all this stuff, believing all this stuff, and stuff will eat my lunch. You're not coming and eating my lunch. You're not even sitting with me at the table. Now, I've been talking like this for 16 years. If I was on a tangent, I'd have been crushed a long time ago. And all I know is I'm more passionate than ever before. Because the more I'm around, the more I see and understand that a lot of times we don't seem to see and understand. Jesus finished the work. And I am delivered. And I promise you this. If you alone, when you're all alone would start declaring that deliverance and thanking God that His Spirit in you is enough and you're free. And no matter what door you opened, no matter who opened what, no matter said what, did what, if I'm forgiven, I'm free. If it's removed and forgotten, it can't bite me. It has no voice. It has no authority. In fact, you've given me all authority. All authority and the power of your name over all the power of the devil. He is not my issue. Growing in you is my issue and receiving your love and saying thank you for life is my issue. You see what I'm saying? But see, I'm, I'm being straight. We're not believing. We're feeling. Yeah, but it doesn't... Yeah, but brother, I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't seem that way to me. That's living by the... That's carnal. And then we cater that. And we take you into something else and try to help you some other way than the truth that makes you free. Because if you continue, 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 do you hear it? If you continue yes. in my word, not your feelings, not somebody's idea, not another person's experience, that's a big one. Yes. But if you continue in my word, continue in my word, continue in my word, you, yes, you will know the truth. And the truth, will make you free see that's what's wrong with me right now serious it's overwhelming me the truth's made me free I'm more passionate you can call it anything you want you could say I'm contentious right now dogmatic you could say I just need to be right <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> it's the truth <gasps> and I'm not gonna sell so cheap when feelings are a dime a dozen I, I'm not going to sell cheap. I've been purchased with a price. And I'm not even my own. Old things are passed away. Behold, oh, power of God. Behold, all things. Well, I don't sure don't feel new, brother. See, that's our response. Well, I don't seem free. Well, I don't, well, I don't, I don't know. Pray for me. That's what we do. And then because we love each other, we pray for each other, but we don't pray in the light of this truth. We pray, come and help. And God's saying, I've done everything. You've got to believe, because if you don't believe, you're going to be ruled by feelings and seem and sensual and intellect still going to rule. And the way that seems right to man is going to be laced all through this amazing life-giving gospel. And it's going to sell it short. The way that seems right. But it doesn't produce life. And then we debate over this stuff and we hold up each other's testimonies and experiences. Yeah, but I this and I struggled for years and I didn't realize this. And then finally one day I realized this thing had me all the while. I promise you, you get alone with God. You get alone with God and close the bedroom door. Man, I challenge everybody in this room, everybody listening. You get alone, you close the door. And by faith, you start lifting your hands when nobody's looking and say, You have made me free. You have saved my life and you're showing me what that means. Holy Spirit, I welcome you because you made me fit to live inside of and you have come to make your home in me. I am yours and you are mine and you love me with unfailing love. I have been delivered from life, from the world, from the devil and the flesh. I am yours. You get real and you start talking like that with a door closed and then you slide to your knees and find tears start rolling down your face because the love of God's there and revelations are coming and you come out of the room and you're like, oh my goodness. I've done it so many times to come out of the room and I don't even know what to do with myself. I'm like, this thing is so real. 
the gospel's so real. Ah. And then people all along the way, well, you're really different. You're an enigma. You're, you just, God put a special grace in your life, a special gift in your life. I'm saying no, no, no. He doesn't have me standing here. If he has, either this is something we're doing in this school. It's one or the other. Either this is something we're doing because we think it's a good idea or Jesus has me standing here. It's one or the other. But if Jesus has me standing here, and if you're here because you believe that, because I don't believe you're here because you believe we're just doing something we think is a good idea. So if Jesus has me standing here, does he have me standing here to teach something that you can't have? Then is it a special gift of grace? Or is it just simply walking in truth? And maybe we've had a hard time defining truth because we've been very sensual and intellectual. We've used our heads more than our hearts. But the heart of man believes, not his head. You have to be very, very careful. Last week we hit it so much, the sensual and the faith thing. And here I am just feeling so passionate in that realm again. I don't believe the greater body of Christ has when they're all alone gotten in communion with God and declared their freedom, their salvation and their deliverance. I believe we've called each other asking for prayer because we feel like we need delivered. And we're, we're living sensual. And I'm, I'm not bashing deliverance ministry right now. There's a place where I've seen people delivered. I've seen things manifest, things happen. There's story after story. But I didn't get to all those experiences chasing after and believing everybody has to have their hidden issue. Those things just happen and Holy Spirit's there. But I know one thing, when I get alone with Him, and I'm convinced of this, I can't prove this, but I believe when you do that, if there is things that aren't clear in you, I believe the mercy of God will slip them out of you without you even knowing it. Because yes. yeah. He doesn't want the hurdles on your track of identity. He does, you don't even need to know that stuff. You just need to know He's good, He's more than enough, and His love never fails, and He's amazing and you're amazing in Him, period. All that other stuff, why do you even need to know that? Just come on. Because now we have enough thing, well, you're saved, but you need delivered. You can't even find that scripturally. Well, you're saved, but now you need delivered. That's a phrase in the church that I hear all the time. You show me where Jesus said that you're saved and not delivered. The salvation of the Lord is all inclusive. It means saved, healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole. Sounds like you're delivered and kept safe and sound. Well, it's good they got saved, brother, but now we got to get them delivered. See, there's a vulnerability that sneaks in, and all of a sudden we believe everybody has to have their closets. You believe everybody has to have a hook in you, in that then I am an enigma if that's true and you say well Dan you're exalting your experience above others no I'm exalting faith and the revelation of knowing that God can make you free if you think I'm exalting my experience above others I just won't accommodate you if you say well I can't believe that yes you're called to that and every man's been given a measure of faith don't say well Dan I can't believe what you're saying because I feel this I won't come up with a way to help you I will just keep preaching the gospel to you and you either get frustrated and walk away or you begin to believe and feel free <laughs> serious it's one or the other I'm not going to accommodate that to just live by what to just live by faith I've had lots of people say Dan what you're preaching is fine but not everybody you have to I've had some pretty popular named ministers tell me this but you have to understand not everybody can believe what you're preaching I said well that's a shame because that's what Jesus preached and he called us to faith and he said those that believe shall be sozoed healed delivered protected and preserved so faith, believing Him and my heart being clean and pure and surrendered brings me into freedom. All of a sudden, everything that was keeping Him from me is out of my heart now and out of my life. So now He <laughs> comes on me. Do you get it? Come on. You're, talking to a, you're looking at a guy right now that got surrendered at night at work. Surrendered. Saw the grossness of my sin. Woke up in the morning praying in tongues. Was aware in the next... 15 minutes of my twisted definition of sexuality and manhood kneeled crying saying it was a curse and you didn't make me this way Holy Spirit breathing on me setting me free forever and then walking in Christ ever since that and I don't know of one time looking back but he taught me faith in that place 
Do you get what I'm saying? And people do it to this day. They do it to this day. They haven't talked to me for years, but they'll call me out of the blue for prayer because they know who I'm going to be. They know who I am. But that's normal. That's you, you, you call on Jesus. That's... <laughs> You know where he is. You know who he's going to be. <laughs> if he said, follow me, and Christ is in us, that same consistency, that same revelation, the light coming on, in his light we see light, the, 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 with his word is the entrance way of light, then we can know, can't we? We can forever know and be free. Is that possible? Is that true? Now watch this. If you don't believe that's true, that's probably the reason it seems this way. That's how serious faith is. That's how serious it is to get along with God by faith and just say what he's saying and say yes to every yes that he says. You see what I'm saying? So this young girl, Mandy, I got into all this. Just This is all coming out of this one question, which is awesome. So when you're suffering like this, from a, from, a, from a sickness, a disease. You can't let that encroach on and overtake who you are, even though there's viable, real, and serious symptoms. Who knows that some diseases have a lot of complications when we don't see healing manifested. So it's not time to criticize healing. It's time to keep growing in love. Thank God He loves us. And when I was in a one witchcraft thing, and it was the third one in a row, that I felt like I was dying and thought I was dying in my mind. I thought you can't endure this pain it, it feels like you're passing out it feels like you're dying I remember smiling in my heart it was so beautiful and, and, in my, in my, and, and it came out of my mouth and I said Jesus I, I'm not even sure what's going on but I know this isn't your will for me I know this isn't you but I'm just letting you know I love you you're amazing and my life is yours and not that I not that I am giving up but even if I would take my last breath I will take it saying Jesus is Lord. There wasn't an ounce of fear. I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I can't die. It wasn't anything like that. It was just this way. And it was amazing how that all worked out. And it was so dramatic and so incredible. And I don't have time to go into it. But it was amazing. You think I get excited when I preach. You've never seen me like I get. You, you, if there was any time on tape that I ever said anything that I wish was on tape, it was those 10 minutes after that happened because the Spirit of God came and delivered me and my ceiling opened up and there was a crystal waterfall coming out of it pouring over me. It's the second time I've seen it in my life. The one time I was in a hospital room when I watched a porno lady and take a brain tumor out of her head. But I don't teach on that stuff because then we think if we don't see that we're not going to end the, the, the manifestations what gives us faith. So I don't teach on that stuff. Some people think, well, he's not this and that. You'd be amazed what I've experienced. I just don't talk about it because we have such need for tangibility that we run after that stuff instead of run after him. You follow me? Yes. You have no idea how concerned I am about that topic. Ugh. But this, 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 this hole opened in my ceiling and this crystal waterfall poured over my head. And this was the third time in witchcraft in a row. And the Spirit of God poured over me, splashing all over me and pushed me to the floor. And I'm just moaning. And it was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I want to say unbelievable, even though I was there. It was that incredible. It's the way we kind of describe something that's hard to grasp. And that was all sovereign mercy. That was all God. I stood up off the floor. I was so free. I was such a warrior in my heart. I was so not afraid. I was so convinced and so sure. And it was like everything the devil was doing to destroy me worked to form Christ in me so much more than he was ever formed in me before. And if I don't understand that, the third time, I'm thinking, third time, what's going on? I feel like a pincushion. What am I doing wrong? Well, if I wasn't doing something wrong, this wouldn't happen again, and he wouldn't have the ability. And, da, 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 da. and now a natural wisdom talking myself right into a mess. Yeah. Look, I don't have the answers for this, but I know one thing. He loves me. He's for me. He paid the amazing price. His Spirit's in me. We're not looking back. We're not looking down. We're looking up from whence comes our help, and we're going to win, period. Look, in my mind, I'm not expecting to die, and I'm not expecting this thing to take me out, but even if I lose breath and don't get off the floor, I still haven't lost. But that's not... I don't want to open that door too big to where people just concede to death because I think it's all about life and living and running your journey and leaving a legacy and not getting taken out by something that's not God. 
I'm not talking about just yielding, oh, well, you can't kill me anyway, and then giving up. I'm not talking about that. Because I, 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 so I stood there, and I remember I lifted my hands, and I began to preach the glory of Christ and the finished work of Christ out of my spirit after this waterfall poured on me. It was amazing. I was pretty passionate <laughs> for about 10 minutes in my house. And you know what I did after that? Don't you hear this wrong and hear this condemning or judgmental? I'm just around a lot of folks and I've been privileged to be in a certain capacity of ministry for a long time. See, I feel emotional. Can you tell I could cry right now? I laid on my bed for an hour and a half and cried uncontrollably because of the extreme of this and I'm around so many people and, I, and it wasn't a haughty proud thing because I'm learning as I go. And I'm laying on my bed and I'm crying and I kept saying, Lord, are we even ready for this kind of assault warfare strategy? Do we understand, know you enough and receive? Are we even ready for this kind of strategy? Do we even understand? I was just crying as a church at large because it was so intense in the physical, in the flesh. But I was so okay in my heart with right understanding. We get our eyes on how intense it is. And because we're not built up here, we're way behind here. Then this begins to be way bigger than we've grown in understanding. And that's a, that's a troubled time. You see what I mean? So in a situation like Mandy's writing about, no matter what it is in your life, don't ever let what's not measuring up to truth identify you, dishearten you, discourage you. In fact, if, if anything, you seek God all the more because you know this is not who you are. And you receive His love constantly. You get it? Okay. Now I want you to begin to pray for Mandy. I'm going to look into this camera. I'm going to pray for Mandy that diabetes get out of her body, that her pancreas work, okay? And, and I'm believing the Spirit of grace is going to come upon this young girl. Mandy, in the name of Jesus, I speak life over you. I command diabetes to get out of your body. Let her go. Pancreas, you work. You function. Holy Spirit, thank you. Come right now and flow right through this woman. Blood, you line up your sugars and insulin. Be normal and properly produced. Diabetes, leave the body. Every symptom, every trace. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name. Mandy, you are loved by God. You are precious. You are worth every drop of the blood of Jesus Christ. Spirit of God, thank you for healing, restoring, and securing the precious woman of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Good deal. You guys all right with me doing a couple of these questions like because they kind of help us corporately? Okay, good. Good, good, good. This one, I'm not going to go into detail because of the personal stuff on it, but it's from Susan. Susan, you'll know who you are. It's about your young son and the child care thing. Uh, but here's the situation Susan has. She believes somebody's doing something knowingly that's not right, but she hears we're called to love and make peace and all this stuff, but it's, it's at the expense of another human being, and she felt like it was... My, my concern first to Susan would be that uh, you have to be sure you know something's intentional. That's a touchy one right there, to just assume they know what they're doing. You always believe the best. If it's, if it's, the, if it's a competency thing, say you're in the medical field, and you're, you're not competent enough and you're treating a patient and you don't have the knowledge and you're mistreating the patient. That's serious. So somebody just needs to intervene. Hey, it's not degrading the person. Look, if you don't have the competency, if you're not doing it right, we're not just going to, oh, bless the Lord, praise God, God just loves her, and, and do it at the expense of the patient. No, somebody needs to intervene and say, hey, you know, you don't really understand your dosage here. You don't understand what you, you're doing. It doesn't seem because this amount isn't correct and you've done it more than once. And, and if they say, oh my gosh, or they, you have to give them... That's how we grow. We get educated. And, and then because to just say it's intentional is, is touchy. Now, I don't know. Uh, Susan believed this situation could be intentional. So that's, that's a paradox. If it's intentional and it's the welfare of a child at stake and all that, just need to address it. It's not a lack of love to address that. It's not judging a person. It's for the sake of, of a person. So if there's a competency thing, address it. My thought in the medical field certainly would be give more education and give the person every chance to do right. You see what I mean? And you monitor the situation and you make sure the right dosage is given and that they learn and do right. If, if you're thinking it's intentional, 
Say we have a situation, we have a mutual friend and there's somebody caretaking and it's an intentional situation and we realize that it's to the detriment of the person that they're caring for, we would simply make a decision, we have the wrong caretaker. <laughs> if for some reason they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and that's not a lack of love to have that addressed, have them removed or have somebody in there that's going to take proper care. You can do that without letting your heart get hateful and angry and hurtful. Do you see what I mean? See, we're just so used to in those situations getting overtaken by it and becoming a product of the wrong that we think to address it is what we're teaching that you can't ever address stuff who knows there's times you have to discipline children who knows there's times you have to discipline or correct people in church in your relationships who knows leadership has to address things within the congregation the key is that when you address things like that to keep it in uprightness you don't do it from a heart that's offended hurt or rubbed wrong because that's there's no grace on that there's that'll only go as far as flesh can take it and it usually creates a mess but you don't, just, you don't just line up your children to truth because you've had enough. And because they ought to know better by now. And because they've rubbed you so wrong that now you're like, oh, you should know better. You know. You're, and then you discipline out of frustration and anger. No, we're growing to a capacity of love where even when I have to discipline, I have to know that it's coming out of my heart for the sake of the person, for their sake, for the long run. But there's times I'm mandated to do certain things as a parent, as a pastor, right? I have to make certain calls. I have to know that the why is clean and clear. In this one, uh, by no means, if there's an intentional thing, would I say that let the situation continue. You have to address it. She, bless her heart, she said, I believe God showed me this and revealed it to me because he knows at this point I would deal with it in mercy. That's a good deal. Dealing with it in mercy is, is just not dealing with it in the flesh. Amen? So uh, I would say address that by all means and, and uh, keep the well-being of your son uh, intact. This is, a, this is a simple one. I'm going to address this one. I'm going to, we're, we're not going to do that one. Uh, th bless her. This is Natalie. And she said she's very young in the Lord. And she's doing this school. And she's realizing how much God loves her. She's watching. She has a little thing here. I won't read it. But she had a question. She said, please don't think my questions are, you know, silly because I don't know that much. I'm in the school to learn and I, and, and I got a lot to learn. She said, you said that the same spirit... Listen to this question. It's amazing how people are thinking. This is, this is something. Oh, this could be a whole class right here. <laughs> Natalie, you got me excited. <laughs> she said, you said the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. What spirit is that? So, you know, that's not a bad question. In other words, she's thinking, is there a specific spirit that was assigned to raise Jesus, etc.? He's simply talking the spirit of God, Holy Spirit, the spirit of the Lord. Okay? The spirit of the Lord. He raised Christ from the dead. He lives in us. And how much more, if he lives in us, will he what? quick in our mortal bodies so now watch your next question she said you said that that spirit lives in us what spirit is that that's the spirit of the lord christ in us the holy spirit right so he lives in us and i always preach this i say why does he live in us why does the same spirit that raised christ live in us so we can do the same thing well look at her next thought well if christ could do all these things on the earth why should i be able to do the same isn't that what makes him stand out See, that's a common thought, that Jesus came to reveal his deity and he came and that he's... See, Jesus on the earth in the flesh, Jesus modeling a life that we're created to live, he said, follow me. Catch this, Natalie, this is awesome. Guys, get this. You guys, a lot of you guys know this, but watch. He didn't say, follow me if I couldn't. He modeled a life that I'm created to live and gave me the same spirit that lives in him, right? That, or that raised him from the dead to live in me, right? So Jesus on the earth doesn't want to stand out. He's showing you what you're created for. He's showing you what Adam was made to walk in and live and be, right? And he's the last Adam. And he fulfilled what Adam failed and now he put his spirit back inside of all of us and said follow me the things I do you'll do if you believe see it all goes back to believing and, and more and that's why our identity is so huge because self-consciousness fear vulnerability frustration all these things that 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 get moved out of us as we keep our eyes on him and keep growing we're growing up into him in all things so don't fret don't get intellectual don't say well God said he'd do all things and heal and I ain't seen and then we get intellectual and we stop growing we stop growing come on if you plant a seed in a little pot do you plant the seed and it just goes 
Is that what happens? If that would happen, you would freak out. Okay, so you put a peach seed in the ground and you're going to start this peach tree and it's this kind and this kind and it, it's, it's a good canning kind or it's, let's just say it's a sun high or a red haven or one of these peaches and you pop it in the ground and you're like, oh God, I thank you. You know, I'm going to get peaches and you pop it in and it just whoa! <laughs> See, that's, this, this, that would be cool. But here's what you do. You plant that thing, fertilize it, you, you, you make sure conditions are right. It's getting sun. It's getting water. And what's it doing? It's growing. It's like a seed. When you sow the seed, it grows. And when it grows, it grows up into this big mature tree. And everything comes to find shade. And it, it's, that's awesome. Enjoy that. Don't stop that. Enjoy growing. Don't get so, think you're so zealous and that makes you so, you know, zeal can be good, but without knowledge, you, can, you oh, but I need to see it now. I don't know, but I just, oh. Uh. I've seen people do that. Ah, there's sick people everywhere. I just need to see them healed now. They're all over. Stop. As much as you're shaking and talking, you could have went out and just prayed for at least one by now. Just take your time. Just go pray for one. Start somewhere. <laughs> I'm not being mean. I'm, I'm, try <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to keep this thing simplistic to just derail some of this stuff that seems to have an appearance of wisdom and it doesn't. Look, we have all these promises. If we believe the things he does and did, we can do if we believe. So what are we growing in? We're growing in believing and understanding. We're growing in a revelation of Christ. That's why communion and union is so important because it's going to branch out and affect every area of our life, like the manifestation of love, the manifestation of power, the working of miracles, right? Even the prophetic uh, stuff in our lives. A lot of us, we want prophetic because, of you know, above all, man, everybody, we want you to all prophesy. So we're like, oh. and, and I'll tell you what, you just let your heart begin, begin to be one with God and you'll start hearing so clear and God can tell himself anything <laughs> right <laughs> so it's not I need a word no you're sincere watch this Watch this. So if I meet Becky and I'm going to pray for her and I got, I, I, I just need to manifest Christ. I'm trying to hear a word. And no, I just need to be sincere and see God's love for her. Period. Amen. And just what happens, happens and flow and just pray and whatever. But you'd be amazed. Like we have to do it in a form and a way and a style and a, there was a friend, he's, he's, he's a close friend of mine. I don't mention his name, but, but he knew me for a while and he came up and he said, he said, you hear God a lot more when you're praying for people than you indicate. You kind of cover up prophecy. Why do you cover up prophecy? I said, because people are crazed over it. And I said, so I cover it up and I tie it into my prayer and I camouflage it completely. He said, I just realized you do that. <laughs> he said, I said, I've been doing it for years. I do it on purpose because of where a lot of us are because if you start doing it and it's not undercover then all the needs is now you got this long line and everybody just wants a word or everybody's coming up well listen I just want you to pray for me what, whatever God says <laughs> go seek him close the door and say I <laughs> a lot of times that's what he's saying Seek me and you'll find me. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. When you pray, close your door. And when you're in the secret, I'll see you there. I'll meet you there and I'll reward you in the open. Boy, I think he's saying that. I could find all that in the Word. <laughs> come unto me, all you who labor heavy laden. Come unto me. Doesn't mean go to a service. Come to me. And we can go to service to get directed to him, hopefully. Come unto me. Right? And who's going to give you rest? He said, I will. Oh, do you get that? Come on, that's intimate. <laughs> Makes me feel fuzzy. <laughs> See, feelings can be okay. They're fun. You just don't live by them. Fuzzy winds are good. So, 
If Christ did all these things, why should I be able to do the same? Isn't that what makes him stand out? He wants us to stand out. Natalie, he wants you to stand out as Christ in in you. Uh, Colossians says, Paul went preaching everywhere till Christ in us is formed. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So the Christ that's inside of me, glory, the manifest attribute of God, the manifestation of God. The Christ in me is the hope of manifesting God. So why is he in me? So I can look like him, so I can do what he did. So he doesn't want to stand out in his earthly ministry and us say, well, that was Jesus. He's firstborn among many. Okay? And this last thought, she said, I've been listening to Power and Love and I asked a friend about healing. She put, bad idea. (laughs) She brought up Paul right away and said he tried to get healed three times and he wasn't. And if this is in the Bible, then why? I'm not going to get long on that because that one's a big door that will hit somewhere along the line. But uh, just so you know, people bring that up all the time. Just so you know, and you can study this out in class. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to Natalie for your own sake. When you read about Paul's thorn, it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks on healing in the church. That Paul wasn't healed. Uh, If you look at the chapter leading up to when he's talking about that situation, he's talking about all the sufferings and persecutions of ministry and life in Christ. If you study out the wordage, even when he uses infirmity, it's not even the word that, that, that sickness, it's human weakness. It's weakness of flesh. He even interchanges when God translated and had the Bible translated. It's amazing because the Holy Spirit's in all this stuff because he's able to guard his word. Who knows he keeps his word and guards his word. See, he, he, infirmity and weakness is interchanged right there in that section of Scripture in 2 Corinthians. Infirmity and weakness is interchanged. It's not at one place does it, is it talking about physical sickness. It's talking about persecutions and suffering. And here's the deal. The word answers every question. Questions are not a threat to God. Did he promise healing in the Bible? Did he promise suffering and persecution for living godly? So he promised both of those, right? Paul was asking for God to remove something that he promised he'd experience. I'll show you the things you must suffer for my name. Paul's asking to remove a thing that was promised and God's not obliged to move the thing that was promised unless he sovereignly chooses to. However, if God wouldn't have promised that, Or if he promised healing and Paul was sick, how can he sovereignly choose to override his word? When his word's the integrity of who he is and it's higher than his name because you don't have the quality of his name without the integrity of his word. If you raised your children like that, it would be child abuse. If you told your kids one thing and then they lived up to that and then you told them, I changed my mind at the last moment, you'd teach them how to what? Never ever take you at your word. So the devil loves when we define God this way and give him the power and say well he's God he can do what he wants that way not apart from who he is the word is God he's magnified his word above his name see the devil loves when we get that loose ended with sovereignty that it's even over the sovereignty is over God's promise because then you'll never know what to believe and you'll never be a person of faith and every sign's to a believer so that would be a problem wouldn't it because that would make God fickle and turning and shifting of shadow and the Bible says he's not so if God promised healing and Paul was sick and had a revelation and is writing all these things to the church and then God shifts on him and says look I know I promised but I'm choosing not to heal you my grace will get you th- through this one yeah but Lord you said in your word and look I know what I said in my word but who's God me or you chill I'm God one day you understand see that, that's don't you embrace that theology because then you can never put your heart into a promise of God here's the deal Paul was asking God to remove something that God already promised he would encounter and he said I'm not taking that from you I already told you this thing was going to press your flesh and you were going to suffer for the things and, and, uh, but just know my grace is greater than what you're feeling right now now get up and keep on trucking boy my grace is sufficient and then Paul said wow so when I'm feeling weak I find I'm really strong because I rely and trust on God because I know in my own flesh I couldn't do what he's asking me but he's empowering me right and he gets right up and keeps on trucking so please don't make Paul's thorn sickness you'll do injustice to the big picture it's not sickness there's nowhere it says it's sickness in fact the Bible honestly my notes in my Bible says please don't get debative over this and nobody really knows what Paul's thorn was and I'm thinking man that is just too soft and gracious of an answer we can know what his thorn was because of the word 
The thorn, it means blow. It says a buffet. That word buffet means blows to the flesh. Look up the word buffet. It means blows to the flesh. I was getting buffeted. I was getting blows to my flesh. I'd go in there with Silas and me and him. We'd go lead people to the Lord and they'd beat our backs and hang us open raw and then chain us to a prison. I'd go in there and all of a sudden they were stoning me and stones were bouncing off my head and off my body and the brethren came and surrounded me and I got up and they beat me with them rods again and again and I was whipped again and again. And, right? <laughs> Come on, that's blows to the flesh. <laughs> And after a while, you and I'd be saying, God, you think you can protect me? I mean, I'm trying to get a few souls saved here. Hello? <laughs> a little bit of covering? <laughs> Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Come on, that's, Paul's life was pretty intense. But he told him, I'll show you the things I must suffer for. You must suffer for my name's sake. So, yeah, Jesus wants us to do the same things he did. He gave us his spirit. He's another. Uh, Natalie, if you'd look in John chapter 14, even 15, 16, read through there and read of the promise of Holy Spirit. It would be beautiful. And you'll see your relationship with Holy Spirit. And we can get on that later in the school maybe. But that whole Paul thing, I just got on that just because I want you guys, you're going to bump into that. You're out in the street praying for somebody. How many people have ever had somebody say, well, you know, Paul had his thorn. This is probably my thorn. And I'm like, well, okay, well, let's just pray anyway. Let's just say it's not and God wants to heal you. Let's just pray. Worst can happen is nothing and it'll keep poking you. That's, but let's just pray. I, a lot of times I won't get in because you can tell by the person and their disposition or their, their way they're talking whether it's going to be a debate or not and they're going to close the door to let you even pray. I'd rather pray first and get my hands on them because I'm the believer. I'm representing the kingdom. If they don't understand, it doesn't hinder anything. Once God comes, the light can come on. And they say, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Well, let me talk to you. Remember when you said about that thorn? Can we talk? Because now they love you anyway. <laughs> right? Because now they're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Now, I had somebody like that get healed. And, and, and it troubled me a little until I got over my own thinking. Because we think too much sometimes. They said, well, no, you know, if God heals me, He'll heal me. If it's His will, He'll heal me. I don't need you to pray for me, da, da, da. And I said, well... What if, let's just say it is his will and, and he wants to heal well no he'll I mean he only heals if it's his will and, and, and I'll just you know I've been fine I'm not even thinking blah, 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 and I finally got to pray and they got instantly healed and, and I said isn't that cool and they said well it's obviously it was his will and this was his time so they didn't relate it to faith believer priesthood and all the stuff we're preaching they just kind of seemed to push it aside and say well he did because he wanted to and it was his time and you know what I mean and, and I was like ah oh. so I had to get faith I had to release faith I had to when I walked away from that situation I thought eh, that is such a bummer mentality God shows up and does all this cool stuff and then we write it off and put it into a category in a box and just suppress what's really going on and I was like Lord you're just bigger than that and I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind and heart around that one and I just blessed the person and asked God to just bless them and reveal himself and, and, and I think it went well then Okay, you guys ready to roll into some uh, some teaching here on... Well, we've been doing that, but... <laughs> I mean, let's open the book. Okay, last week, we hit hard, real hard on some righteousness stuff. Your identity in Christ, being righteous, you're loved by God. We covered a lot of stuff last week. We got on a lot of little tangents, didn't we? We kind of like just went here and there and everywhere, didn't we? Ah, let's just go home. I think we cover a lot. <laughs> no, I'm still going to camp just a little bit because I didn't get near. I felt like last week went like a blur. I, I thought the first school I didn't think went real fast. Actually, I don't know why. Uh, I think there was some schedule challenges with me and some different things going on, but it just seemed like it went longer. Last week seemed like one day or two days of school. One day, maybe. It just went like a blur. Who felt that way last week? Just went... Because I thought, man, we only got 12 weeks left. So, <laughs> there, there is still a couple things in my heart about, I'll tell you what, I was going to go to Hebrews, but let's go to Romans, because we got 12 weeks. <laughs> what I believe the intent of the Lord is in my heart when I do this stuff and we go to all these scriptures, like we camped in some scriptures last week that you're blameless, you're holy and above reproach, right? If indeed you continue faith as you received Christ, next chapter, so walk in Him, right? 
And that's by faith, rooted and grounded, established in the faith. It says, don't let anyone cheat you or hold you captive. That was the time when Olivia read the Amplified, right? We had the Message Bible. There was some intense language there about plundering you and robbing you and, and man's ideas and the world's ways and the world's wisdom. It says, don't anybody plunder you or take you captive. See to it that that doesn't happen. Strong language, right? We covered all that. And, and, and it's not uh, uh, selling you into Christ and, and identifying you through Christ. If it's any other thing than Christ, it's not the way. See? Now see, we think that's so, you know, I had a lady come, she was doing her, her uh, thesis thing for her. She was going to some college, it's in Baltimore, and it was on spirituality, and it was, it was new agey, it was this, that was one of those, it was kind of like a Unitarian, kind of universal peace kind of thing, and, and uh, she's doing her final thing, and she was on a deadline, and this lady sent her to me, and said, oh my gosh, you got to go, because she had to do an interview with someone that was seen as spiritual, to, to finish her final project and she's on this deadline to turn it in and she came to my to me and I don't know this lady and I don't know what she believes what she's doing and when I asked her what she's doing she started to describe me in this institute in Baltimore she went to and and and, and even if I remembered her name I wouldn't say it just because but but she's there and I'm sitting there thinking oh my goodness and I said honey why why me why did you pick me why? She said, well, so-and-so. And I went, oh, that makes sense. Okay. And there was somebody that I had just gotten to know and was coming to healing services. And, and this person said, you've got to go check this guy out. He is so spiritual. And she said, he is probably the most open-minded man I've ever met. So when she heard open-minded, she's here and I got room for every door. I'm like open for anything. So I'm her man. She's come because she wants me to do the interview because that's her whole thing. And she told me the reason she chose me was that reason. And oh, I chuckled inside. Uh, I wish that whole time was on video. It was amazing. Because she's talking about this universal peace and, and, and unity and everybody getting along in the same room all drinking punch together and toasting glasses with all our different gods and all our different beliefs but yet we all see that you know the value and etc which who knows I can do that still see your value but I said to her I said well honey I said that's amazing that she has that impression on me says I said when it comes to the things of God I'd like to think I'm as open as I can possibly be and she's just like oh this is gonna be so. but I when it comes to my pursuit of God and my access to him I said I might be as narrow as any man you've ever met. And I went like this and I said, because I looked through a very, very fine eye. And I started talking Jesus to her. And she totally freaked out and manifested. Anger and vile and you have no idea. And I stayed real calm and smiled and I said, honey, you see how surface your peace thing is? There's no peace in your heart. You hate me for what I believe. I said it's so surface it's so shallow it's so rosy and mystical and it's deceived I said the reason Jesus came is because of what's spewing out of you right now because there's nothing about this God you're proclaiming coming out of you right now I can't see him in you but I said I can look in the eyes and tell you I love you you're precious you just don't understand she was so I never saw somebody so undone so undone but there's pride there she's shuffling her papers I said, sweetie, do you see why we need salvation? Because of the capacity of a human heart apart from Him. You can talk the talk, but you have no ability to walk this walk. I said, you despise me right now. The more I talk, and she's... <laughs> <laughs> it was really serious. And I soft and said, I love you. She just, she, she wouldn't even talk anymore. She was, and I'm okay with that. I don't have to tackle her and get her to pray some prayer. I, that to me is such vital. See, that is so awesome. That's just, you love her God, get her God. She walked out the door and I grabbed staff. We prayed and got in a circle and I just shared a little bit of what was going on. We just prayed for her. And probably wept for her. Just asked God to come. But isn't that cool? Because it's a very narrow way. <coughs> Confined is the way. Few are those. Actually find it. 
You know, that, 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 that's a catchy phrase. Few of those who find it. That's the total liberty and freedom through the one way, the way, where their whole identity is surrounded and embraced by Christ and Him and Him alone. And I think there's so many other things that make the way broader than it is. So many other ideas, feelings, motivations. So many other things that identify us and find value in. and Our esteem. Uh, we, we don't realize how much our esteem and just our security is hinging on other things. Just people. What people say and don't say is so huge to us that we're driven by it and don't even realize and go to church every week and we're driven by people. Narrow is the way. Confined is the way. And few are those who... <gasps> Find it. You know what's cool? You go through that door. It's like, whoa. You can't only get through the door. It's so narrow. And you get through and go, and you're in this big wide place. (laughs) It's like you go through this narrow door. And the psalmist, he said, he set me in a broad place. Well, how do you go through? It's the narrow door. You go through the narrow door and it's like, the kingdom. Whoa. And, and it is where the idea is probably is that the door is so little and it was so hard to get through, why would you ever try to weasel back out? <laughs> why, why would you have to work to get out? <laughs> You'd have to try hard to get back through there. Just get through. Ah, did you hear a ah, ah. That's kind of how truth is. It makes you free. Amen? Yay. <laughs> yeah, the anointing to make you slippy. <laughs> She's thinking spiritual up here on the front. That's why you need the anointing oil, the oil of God to get you slippery so you can get through. <laughs> yeah, amen. No, that's good. Okay, guys, we got to jump to this and we're going to be taking a break here soon, aren't we? Man. <laughs> Are you having fun? <laughs> it's just good. God's good. Man, remember we hit Romans 5 a little bit last week. I was showing you how while we were yet sinners, He sent His Son. Isn't that amazing? That for scarce, scarcely for a righteous man, verse 7, one would die. But maybe for a good man, one would even dare to die. But God demonstrated His love for us while we were still sinners. That means at nature, at heart, at will. Right? We were doing that stuff at will. God said... I see better for you. I see you for better. Isn't that cool? Come on, it's a big deal. And then he says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies and were reconciled, while enemies to God, through the death of his son. I love this whole chapter. This is like a much more, much more chapter. If we were enemies and while enemies reconciled to God through the death of Jesus how much more having been now made friends reconciled literally means to be made friends we shall be saved sozoed by his life you see the redemption and the restoration in that so while I was yet an enemy and a sinner uh, and an enemy alienated like that scripture in Colossians alienated by wicked works in my mind I was an enemy right I'm reconciled to God through death how much more now that I've been made reconciled shall I be saved by his life isn't that amazing so there's a whole lot more than praying that prayer to get saved there's a redemption of all things emotions mindsets the, the, where you live from it's a big deal and redemption comes there. I'm, 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 I'm not, I, I just want you to see righteousness in this. Not only that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the what? The reconciliation. So do you see that it is a big deal for you to know that God's made you reconciled and friends? Do you see that? In John he said, I no, no longer call you servants. I call you friends. You know Why? He said, because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing and I've revealed the will of the Father to you by coming. So he left us in on it, right? So we're not just serving the Lord. We're living through him, manifesting who he is. Do you get it? We're not living for God. We're living through God. That's 1 John 4. It's a big difference, be living for God and through God. 
One, you get weary and wonder if you're living good enough. <laughs> the other's a pretty excited place and you're already measured up in Christ and it's just good. Watch. Therefore, therefore, we're rejoicing because we have received. So do you see that there's, I'm going to camp here a minute. Do you see there's a place for you to rejoice that you've been made friends with God? Do you know how many countless people have gone to church and haven't even considered that? that they're friends with God and that they're right with God and that they're reconciled. God, you made me right with you. You've reconciled. You've come and made peace between you and me. There's no war. And oh my goodness, I didn't see this before, but why wouldn't I want you? Why didn't... Oh God, thanks for illuminating my heart. I'm home. I'm here. And you're amazing. Thanks for loving me. <laughs> Come on, people don't do that. They don't pray like that. I ask around and talk to people when I'm alone with them and ask them if they pray that way. I don't do it publicly because I don't, I'm not here to just... Because if I'd go around the room right now and say, who continually, just that's a normal way of thinking to you and you just pray that way, or maybe you've tried to pray that way, or don't pray that way, you'd be amazed at the response even in this room. That we're not thinking that, let alone giving ourselves to that. Because we're actually thinking doing better, trying a little harder, or we have a list, a hit list of all the things that are wrong that need to spruce up in our life. So when we do get alone with God, we're so self-conscious and we take 20 minutes to get past ourself and by then it's time to go out of the room anyway. So we're like kind of covering our misnomers and it's a wonder you, God, thank you for forgiving me. And it's just all this troubleshooting. <sighs> Instead of we rejoice in God that through Jesus we've received reconciliation yay I've been made right with God <laughs> rejoice I've been made right with God <laughs> okay yes. come on you're rejoicing in that you're supposed to believe that yes. the gospel's enough the blood's enough yes. <laughs> Todd was with some men once and he was eating and, and they wanted to take him to lunch. This was before anybody knew who Todd was. And, and uh, well, Jesus knew, but people didn't know. He didn't media. He was just running with me. We were going to meetings together and he was growing and he was, but these men were sitting with him and they asked about his life, his testimony a little. And he started sharing his testimony and he said, uh, well, yeah, he said, oh, I had a terrible upbringing, and, and they're listening, because we get into that childhood stuff, and he said, I was raised by the Masons, and, and he said, when he said I was raised by the Masons, he said, they dropped their silverware, and begin to pray, and do all this stuff, and speak, and pray over him, and gestures with their hands, and pray, and, and he's like, guys, what are you doing? You're freaking me out, <laughs> and they're like, the Masons, don't you understand, and they're like, don't you realize, and it made a real drawl on them, the Masons and I understand their stuff and I understand that I'm not making light of that but they're making so much of it that it becomes bigger than God yeah. uh -huh. that when he just speaks Mason <gasps> I mean that's like that's like a worship service the wrong way and he's like guys and they said you were and they said haven't you ever been through this haven't you ever done this haven't anyone ever prayed he said, no. Why? Why? He said, you don't understand what you're dealing with here. This has so, such strong, powerful roots and such this, that, and you need this and you need that. And he said, guys, stop. You're all freaking me out. Now, this is cool because we didn't have conversations. I wasn't teaching against things to Todd. I'm just teaching him Jesus, finished work, righteousness. I'm just being me and teaching him truth. So when he bumps into this, he doesn't have a grid for it. And he's like... What are you guys doing? <laughs> and they said, yeah, but you don't understand. And he said, well, no, wait a minute. He said, he said, 2 Corinthians 5 says, I'm a new creature. And they went, yeah, yeah, that's what everybody says. That's, that's what you're supposed to say. That's the scriptures. But the reality is, your people aren't free. So they're taking the scripture, saying, yeah, I know you're using that scripture, but, but... And he said, guys, no, look at me. He had the one man look right at him. He said, look at me. Wonder if I really do believe that scripture. And wonder if the blood is enough. And wonder if I am a new creature and it's not ever about looking back. 
And this is what he was told. Unless you do this one thing, you'll never make it. That's what he was told. And Todd called me troubled and asked me what was going on. And I explained. I said, you'll find that we have gained so much through our experiences instead of his word that we ride our experiences and everybody's testimonies instead of his word that we've diminished his word and elevated our experiences to where now if you declare his word you're just hypo spiritual and you're in denial isn't that amazing and I just shared with him I said I think you're okay he said I think I am but I told him this, I said, you'll find that when you're in a service and you share something like the Masons or if you say something about witchcraft, you'll get a bigger gasp and a bigger response corporately than if you stand and say, Jesus is Lord. And that's a sure sign right there. If you get talking and you say, well, then this person, and I found that they were into this or into that, people go, oh my God, whoa. <laughs> and they react because that thing means something to us now. That's the, that's the devil's plan that stuff would gain notoriety and gain power in your soul to where you begin to honor it in weird forms just fearing it is honoring it you follow me? And you hear its name and you go oh my god and you drop your silverware and you start doing all this stuff what you're saying is you're awesome you're amazing and if God doesn't intervene right now we got to get God to come because oh my gosh you're amazing and it's a form of, it's a twisted form of honor. Yeah, I see you. Thank you, honey. <laughs> you're so good. <laughs> I just here she is so good. She's getting better and better too as the days go on. She used to just go like this, now she's doing this. <laughs> Pretty soon she'll be landing airplanes. When they do, <laughs> she'll have the old. Yes, yeah, she'll have the glow sticks. She'll be like, <laughs> "We love you, Sue." But just a thought, you know. Not I'm not I'm not trying to bash things. I'm getting you to. I want you to think about what we do from here. And what gives this what gives this substantiation is because we have so many stories we can relate to and so many people's experiences. My heart cry is always, who's really believing the word? Who's really alone with God and declaring truth and walking in communion? That's what we're called to do. And Jesus actually says we're free. <laughs> so if freedom isn't my experience, I need to keep pursuing him because freedom's mine. Do you get what I'm saying? And I don't need to take four stops along the way to get to what he told me. I just need to stay with him, follow him. And along the way, if he needs to help me or Holy Spirit needs to intervene, I was in a counseling session one time and the Lord showed me a 12-year-old boy. These people were in their upper 30s. He showed me a 12-year-old boy on the streets of New York crying, Mommy, while I was sitting there. And I said, why do I see a 12-year-old on the streets of New York crying, Mommy? And the man cried harder than you've probably ever seen a man cry. He couldn't even breathe. His mom was a heroin addict. She took him on the streets of New York and lost him in the crowd. And he never saw her again. They found her dead in an alley. His wife didn't even know the story because he didn't want to dishonor her. And his uncle and aunt raised him and decided to protect the honor of his mother and keep it the family secret. The Holy Spirit seemed interested in exposing that and healing him and showing that so we follow Holy Spirit we follow the leading of Holy Spirit if I turn that same working of Holy Spirit into a method of ministry thinking that everybody has their issue then I could step out of grace and open doors that he's not even knocking on let alone opening just be careful that you live by faith and you follow Holy Spirit and don't ask him to follow you you okay? See, we take a gift of Holy Spirit and turn it into a method of ministry. We're probably going to make mistakes. If I'm, not, if I'm not seeing that 12-year-old boy on the street in that room, thank God I did. If I'm not, I have to have confidence in my relationship in the Word of God that we have answers for that right here. But Holy Spirit just seemed like He wanted to fix that right there. Because there was so much animosity and when the wife learned what the husband went through and had no knowledge mercy rose up they wouldn't even sit together she ran across and held him crying 
So once that knowledge came to her by the Spirit of God, her heart melted and she wasn't mad anymore. And once she knew the whole truth, she just ran and held. And it was a beautiful thing. But it was a straight up working of Holy Spirit. And I could tell you a few other stories like that where it had to do with going backwards. So I understand there's a working there. People carry strongholds and things. But Holy Spirit loves people and knows those things. And you have to have confidence in His ministry. Holy Spirit's ministry. And honor this above everything in your life. You follow me? Because the truth is, this is the real you. I found you in here. And you look amazing to the Lord. And I need to convey that to you and trust you're going to see that one day, right? Period. That's what He gave us, His Word. He so loved the world, He gave His Word. Right? And He came and was made flesh and dwelt among us. Why don't you all take a break and we'll, we'll pick up. Bless you guys. Stretch, say hi to somebody, meet somebody you didn't get to meet yet. Give somebody a good hug or something. <laughs> you guys ready? Everybody coming in? Snacks are better than the preaching. Sue, the snacks are better than the preaching. Oh, yeah, I'm, my whole identity's gone. Somebody pray for me. <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, you ready? We're going to start. Ready or not? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, here we go. I'm going to jump right back into... Uh, let's just jump back into Romans 5 quick. And uh, see, I, I stop on stuff like that and highlight it because I want you to see... Like when we started in uh, chapter 5, verse 1, last week we hit, You've been justified by faith and have peace with God. So do you hear what it's saying? It's, 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 it's not saying you feel peace with God. You have peace with God. God has made peace with you by removing sin. Do you see how adamant that is? So you're not trying to have peace. You have peace with God. You have to hear how the Bible says this because this is where, because you're justified by what? Faith. So faith is the initial uh, receiving of that truth. You have to start with peace with God. You see what I'm saying? You're not trying to make peace. You're not doing the peace atonements and sacrifices. Jesus did all that. And He made peace with God for you. So, and then, and then it says you have access into his, by faith into His grace. That's verse 2, which you stand rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. So there's a rejoicing. Here's that word rejoice again. I'm back in uh, Romans 5, but backed up to verse 2. You're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. And the glory of God is the manifestation of God. Isn't that beautiful? So you're rejoicing in growing up in Him. You're rejoicing that He's revealing Himself to you and through you, that your life is changed because of Him. There's a rejoicing. Do you hear how that has to be faith? Because you're faced with everyday challenges, everyday emotions. You're faced with the circumstances and situations of life. But what are you going to allow to dictate who you are and why you are? This truth right here. This is what it means. And I'm, it seems like I'm really being redundant to some maybe and hitting this over and over. It's on purpose. It's on purpose. We did this all last week and hit this hard and we went into a lot of other things and a lot of time went with other things. We nailed some stuff and people responded to me and you guys are so gracious afterward. You know, you're like, man, I think I know why you got on that and then you share stuff so sincere. It's just fun. But because uh, I get up here and we're just going, you know, I, I don't really have a plan, but it gets, stuff gets big in my heart. So I'm looking at this and this stands out to me. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Well, see... If I'm living by faith in the Bible's expecting that I'm in this place rejoicing, then I probably need to enter in there and start to step in by faith to the place of where I'm communing with God. Father, I rejoice in the fact that I've been made right with you. There's peace between us. You live in me because you want to. And there's a greater revealing of who you are to me. And you want to flow through me. I thank you. I'm not lacking any good thing. All that is mine is yours. I yield myself to you. And I know that you're growing me up into you in all things. God, I thank you. Just gripping my heart, my mind, my life with your love and your power. There's a place to just start entering into saying yes. Do you get what I'm saying? I think we're just waiting to feel better. 
serious. I think we're just waiting to wake up and it's today the day I'm going to feel better. No, maybe tomorrow. How you doing? Hey, could you pray for me? <laughs> I'm, I'm not being smart. I'm being real. That's what we, we're just waiting to feel better. Like one day this thing's just going to drop on my lap and open up and <gasps> be mine. No, you grow up into Him in all things. Remember that I said about you don't just pop a peach seed in or you don't plant a seed and just... No, it grows. You watch it grow. You enjoy the process. Who's ever planted something and just watched it grow? I garden, so I enjoy it. I, I plant stuff. I nurture it. I, I get out there and I weed my own garden like you do your own life, right? And, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, there's so much good stuff about the garden. You know, there was a time I planted, I planted beans in my garden. And it was cool weather. The nights were cool. And I planted beans. And I always plant my garden early. And I get away with it. It's good. And uh, I planted beans. And beans, anybody can grow beans, okay? So if you grow beans, don't, don't try to draw your identity from growing beans. It's a false identity. Anybody can grow beans. <laughs> beans are just easy to grow. <laughs> so if you need encouraged as a gardener, start with beans. <laughs> and plant some. But watch this. You put beans in and the sun's shining and you wet the ground, beans just grow. That's what they use in class in school with the paper towels. and the, They just grow. They just sprout. It's like every one you put in the ground comes up. It's just so fun. You can put three rows in standard and not see no gaps anywhere. It's like every seed comes up. It's like 100%. It's like, this is cool. So I plant beans this year. We love, we can beans. We jar beans. We, 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 we live like the old time days. We jar our stuff. It's fun. So I'm growing beans. At least I think I am. And they, they aren't coming up. And they're always up. Even when there's cool nights, they're, they're up in seven days. You plant beans right now, they're out of the ground in three. And I just know that from gardening because I plant rotation crops. I don't have much yard. I have to use it wisely. And I plant it tight and you can't even see my dirt out there. It's just, oh, garden. It's like, yes. <laughs> It's Eden. I go out there and walk in the cool of the day. And on a hot day, I just believe it's cool. <laughs> no be yeah, yeah, yeah. Mist. Get the mist going. You're good, Brent. So, so no beans come up. Now we're two weeks. Two weeks. And I've grown beans my whole life in the yard. Two weeks and I've got no beans. So what happens? You start living by what you and think. So guess what I do? Wow. I planted them early. They've been in the ground so long. I wonder if the moisture and just wetting them down in the cool, if they, if they rotted in the ground. I wonder if I got a bad batch of seeds. Man, if they were going to come up, they'd have come up by now. If God was going to heal, he'd have healed by now. If God was going to do this, he'd have probably done it by now. I've been doing all the right things. and See, it's not works anyway. So we, but we do that. We assess. We have a way of thinking. The way that seems right. So I'm out there and I'm not... This isn't a spiritual moment for me. I'm not talking even to the Lord about my beans. I'm just thinking. I'm out in my yard. I'm just thinking. Hmm. Bet this. Wow. Hmm. Wow. I knelt down and I thought, well, I need to get in one of these rows and check one of these rows because something's wrong. I took my finger started digging in the ground right where I knew the rows were and I dug back because I have them I, I plant everything real tight I keep my ground real rich and I get away with I, I plant my beans tight so I knew I wouldn't have to go far to find a bean and when I flipped that little fella up you guys that grow stuff know what a tap root is and the little white roots straight down and the beans unwrapping and he's opening up and he's this far into the ground just ready to come up and when I did that once you pull that thing out you, you, he's done he's dead you, tap, you pulled out that little root and, 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 and it's at a vulnerable as soon as I pulled that out I went oh my gosh they're growing and the spirit of the Lord came upon me in the yard I'm kneeling I mean somebody neighbor would look out and think oh my gosh Dan's taking his garden serious his beans ain't coming up and he is just really crying <laughs> because I was kneeling there in my garden I was bawling I was bawling because the Lord slipped up on me and His presence came down over me and He said, My people do it all the time. That's what He said. 
They're, they're, they're wanting something, wishing something, intending something, sowing something, in, in position for something. And then time gets them thinking and intellect agrees and sight and a vice here and there. And next thing you know, you dig up what was just about ready to come out of the ground. It has to be important if I'm just one little fellow on the earth. Just checking my beans, guys. It wasn't some, I wasn't out there in, I'd like to tell you I had the stereo blurring and I was praying in tongues, checking my beans. I was just checking my beans. I was just thinking, checking my beans, and as soon as I did, the Spirit of God came upon me and said, happens all the time. I could hear it in my heart that it was like all the time. Not that he's frustrated. He longs for us. He wants to bless us. He wants to love us. Can you imagine the love of God when, when he's saying, I love you, Trish, through Jesus Christ. And Trish would be struggling, and I wish God, and I don't need... Can you imagine his heart? I love you. There was a time my wife, she was struggling receiving the love of God and, and I was talking to her about the pressure she is and she said, well, you know, you're supposed to tell me that. And I said, stop that. What do you mean I'm supposed to tell you that? The Word of God, the cross tells you that. And, and then the, the months go by, right? And she came to me and, and, and I said, what's going on? And she said, well, my heart's just hurting and it's why. And, and Lisa was at an age and I don't even remember the situation, but Kim was like trying to, she just... Lisa was getting a little older and you know girls could you moms could probably relate she was getting a little older and she was changing a little and she wasn't like I guess seeming to be mommy's little girl anymore as much as she wanted her to be and, and, and she'd come home from school and have other things in her mind run to a room do this and that and Kim wanted to talk to her make contact keep her in a certain sense of relationship in a certain definition and she said well I don't know if you understand and I said well talk to me give me a chance and she said well she said she said, uh, you know, it's really hard. She said, I don't know how you handle it when you really love somebody and you really want to love them and it's like they just don't receive it and they don't want your love or they don't believe your love or they don't respond to your love. And I said, what are you talking about? And then she cried and talked about Lisa. And I said, wow. And I, I said, just imagine the Father's heart. He says this dramatic, I love you through his son on the cross. And people say, well, he can't love me. And, oh, she... <laughs> it's a pretty intense time. But see, she was feeling that same thing. It'd be the same way. He's like, no, but I love you. I love you, Trish. Right? Here I am, using my intellect, changing my mind in the sense of, you know, instead of just, you know... Now, now that was a garden and I, and I had natural reasons but you'd be amazed how there are a dime a dozen in every situation especially healing right he says lay your hands on the sick believing they shall recover that's what he says and we say yeah but and then we got our whole list right so when are we believing when we believe that list the fact that we have the list proves we don't believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so... <laughs> because we have a multiple choice option. We have another scenario already laid out. We already have our experience shouting way louder than the promise. Oh, I'm preaching good. Come on. The fact that you have the list says everything, doesn't it? Because if you have the list, how do you believe? Because if you have the list, then you confess to believe unless. I believe, well, of course, but I believe if, I believe but. Jesus didn't have that list. He didn't have the list because it wasn't in his experience. The only reason we have the list is because we're accommodating our experience. Therefore, assuring to keep it alive and long-lived and increased, our experience. <laughs> and we all say we're seeking His kingdom and His glory. <laughs> but we sure have our experience secured and intact with our belief system. <laughs> assuring that we put a ceiling and we're going to get the same thing. For generations, if something doesn't shift, right? Right? 
In other words, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can pray for me, but don't get, well, it's not like that. He doesn't heal everybody. Remember, we prayed for so-and-so and prayed and prayed and prayed, and then they finally died. So, I mean, sure, you can pray for me, but it's not about, you know, and if God chooses to take me, I mean, you just need to, and I don't want you disappointed. I, you talk like that. Now, if we're talking like that, <laughs> it's because that's what we believe. Do you know the Bible says, out of your heart, your mouth speaks? That is a big one. You can hear what people believe by their language. Yeah. Linda. Yeah, there, well, there was, there was uh, Linda's asking about the beans, tying the beans in. There was natural things that ran through my mind. And time began to be in question. Like say when you're praying, when you're praying over your body, physical. And all of a sudden, or, or even like that thing when I said I had the words in my head, and then I was just telling Holy Spirit how I felt every time I heard those words, remember? After a week or two, you get tempted with the thought, is this working? Well, it's not a method, it's a relationship and a lifestyle. Do you get what I'm saying? So I planted those beans, and when that happened, I left my, the ability to think things through, which it wasn't gross, bad thoughts. It was rational thoughts. Could have been a bad batch of beans. They could have got rotted in the ground. If seed lays in the ground too long, it could get, if it's moist and it's not warm enough to germinate, they could decompose. They could begin to get rotten inside. They could mold. They could, and then they could go invalid. You see what I'm saying? So all those thoughts were crossing my mind, which caused me to abort one of those seeds, to dig one up which didn't hurt anything in that sense. It just showed me spiritually that we do that all the time. The Lord said, we do it all the time. Well, if I was going to be healed, I'd be healed by now. Well, if God really loved me, why don't I feel His love? Well, if God wants me to have peace, then why is my mind a wreck? And all of a sudden, we let our natural experience challenge Him constantly and let human intellect in the face of truth. Do you see what I'm saying? So don't dig up your beans. <laughs> They're growing. You, you might say, well, I'm not sure that God loves me. Well, you might not be sure in the sense of feeling it and knowing it in that sense, but you're sure in the sense of what the Bible says. So start there and rejoice. Just start there and rejoice and camp there and rejoice. And all of a sudden the knowing begins to come alive. If you don't do that, you'll have a rational way of thinking. You'll have it all laid out and you'll have it all figured out and be way, way wrong. 30 years down the road. You see what I'm saying? Because you're not, it's not the foundation of faith based on the finished work of Christ. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the big deal. Unless I come through Him. So that's where that lady, I'm open-minded. Oh yeah, I'm way open-minded. God can do anything. Nothing's impossible. The Spirit of God wants to come. Death has no power. Yeah, I'm way open-minded concerned the finished work of Christ. But way narrow on how to get there. Through Him and His work and His work alone. Boy, that takes the pressure off of us, doesn't it? It's not even how I'm praying. It's what I'm believing. It's not even my, my, I'm not even pressured to pray right. I just believe right. It has nothing to do with saying the right words. He did the right thing. That's how your righteousness is received, right? Who reconciled you? He did. Who made you right? He did. So how do you receive it? Thank you. <laughs> is that easy? It should be easy. We got to make that easy and not, well, yeah, but I don't know why he would have done that for me. And then you start evaluating and identifying yourself for other things. No, the fact that he came makes you precious and special to God. So there's something he's seeing about you that you got to fix your eyes on and grow in, right? So if he reconciled you, if he made you right, then say yes. Say thanks. Say thanks for loving me, right? It's a big deal. And don't let these things that you're experiencing contrary to the blessing of the Lord that we've been taught or the covenant of the Lord or the promise of the Lord. Don't let these things contrary keep getting in your face and reevaluating and re-identifying you. Don't let time dictate the future of those beings, right? You let truth dictate. Does this make sense? I'm telling you, time has 
robbed a lot of us because the intellect kicks in. Like, like when I had those voices and I was, I didn't have a problem. I, I'm telling you, God, God Almighty, He gives me His kingdom, the power of His word, the power of His name. I got a picture years ago of God sitting on a throne. Now, I couldn't see His physical features. He'd have probably looked like me because we're one. And, but, but, <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Heretic! Ah! <laughs> Don't kill me! You'll force me to be with him forever. <laughs> okay, stop! Stop! Everybody, stop! <laughs> so, so, I do know one thing: the DNA of every father is in every one of his children, whether they know the child or not. And he is the Father. The DNA. Yeah. Zinni. So, I got this picture of God sitting on a throne. I was going through some stuff. And I realized that faith was being tested at the time. It was way back. And, and, and then I realized, wow, when I got this revelation, I realized that's what was happening with those voices. I got this picture of God sitting on a throne. He's sitting on a throne, and I could see He was high on a throne. It's scriptural, isn't it? Seated high. But He had His arms crossed, and He was kind of looking down. I could see His face looking down, but I couldn't see His facial features. And He's looking down, and I heard Him say, So what are you going to do? That's what He said. He's looking at me in the trial, and He said, So what are you going to do? And that's the impression I've had for about 15 years. Here's what we do. God, what are you going to... I'm going through this. What are you going to do? God, this is happening. What are you going to do? God, what are you going to do? God, where have you been? Why are you... Hello? Don't you hear me when I pray? <laughs> and I get this picture from Holy Spirit. So what are you going to do? Because I respond in Christ. I have the authority of His name. Nothing by any means shall harm me. I have power over all the power. Because He's the head and He's in me. And He's over all things. And it's the Father. Fear not. Shh, fear not. Shh. Little flock, fear not. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What's that mean? Is that just something to pacify you and comfort you when you're razzled? It's the way you're to live. So I always would get this impression that God... So when those voices were coming, here, here was the Father. Oh, you go, boy. You really believe in my word. This is so fun. I'm playing the devil like a pawn. And because he's speaking to you, you're getting to know me more. You're knowing the truth more. He's not busting the devil in the chop saying, shut up and stop talking to my kid like that. That's how we think. We're waiting for God to just bam. Just bust him in the mouth. And God's sitting there letting him yak, yak, yak because I'm responding in truth and the yak, yak, yak's taking me right to truth. And God's going, oh, this is so fun. I love playing the devil like a fool. Thanks for believing, Dan. This is cool. My grace is on you. <laughs> See, but we think it's a problem because I'm hearing junk. It's only a problem if I don't have the weapon of my warfare established, casting down every lie with truth. <gasps> every what? Every thought captive bringing it into the obedience of Christ. It's everything that raises above the... Not, 2 Corinthians verse 10, or chapter 10, it says everything that rises above the knowledge of God. Everything that says you are what you are apart from Christ, or that you're going to go through, or anything that's apart from Christ, anything that's above the knowledge of God concerning your life, you cast it down by bringing it captive and into obedience according to Christ. What's that mean? You yell at it? You curse at it? You tell it why it doesn't have power? No. You proclaim truth. And you see through a clear eye and you declare Him. So when you're hearing yak, 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 and it's not your heart, I love you, Holy Spirit. You're amazing. You're my best friend. Now I'm building relationship and revelation of Holy Spirit and learning how to never live by feelings, impressions, thoughts, but to live out of my heart because my heart says, I love you. Do I need delivered? Do I need somebody to slap oil on my head and cast a devil out of my head? I didn't have a devil. I have Jesus. I had a lying, trying spirit coming to try to rob my identity short because he's believing that we don't know who we are. 
He's believing if we keep ourselves from knowing who we are, we'll surely never know who He is. And then we'll never defeat Him. So He's trying to keep us muddy and foggy so we never see the truth of who He is and who we've become. So I'm hungry and I'm growing, so yak, 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 trying to get me like I got some hidden issue and I got some defiled heart and I'm not really sincere. When I look inside and it makes me cry to think that because all I know is I love God. Who's ever felt that way and you were being lied to in your mind but that you felt like, but I love God. And, and then you feel like you need ministry. Yeah. You need to rise up and declare your love for God all the more. I really love you. Yuck, 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 yuck. Oh, you're amazing to me. <laughs> See, so God's sitting there going like this. And he's letting the whole thing unravel. Because I, am I a man with a problem? I'm a man with a heart change, a covenant, a God. I'm a man with a promise. Do you get it? Two weeks into it, if I get into methods, 30-day money-back guarantee stuff, try me, see if you like me mentality, weekend warrior, fly by night. Wow, if this was really God, it would be working by now. Working. See, what we mean is the voice would have stopped. This would be, so we're doing it just to get superficial evidence or, or, or just surface evidence to get the voice to stop. The voice is not my problem. Not heeding truth is my problem. Taking the voice personal could be a problem. The voice is not a problem. Speak on. You're spurring me to Christ. You're spurring me to truth. I guarantee you this. Nine months into my Christian life, six months, close to six months, I heard the voice. You can't believe how much I heard it in the beginning. I can't tell you later on because I had so much fun growing in Holy Spirit and he'd preach to me for an hour and a half. And then this stupid voice, this silly, stupid voice would be dumb enough to come and go yak, yak again. And it was just like a pool cord in the Holy Ghost. Yak, yak, yak. It was like, yak, yak, yak. Serious. So nine months into being saved, because it was three months, I was three months saved when that started happening. Now I'm nine months in the Lord, six months after. I can't tell you when the voice stopped because I was not focusing on it. It was actually trained me. It trained me that when I heard it to respond out of my heart. And what it also taught me is not to let everything that goes through my head to take it personal and attach it to my heart. Because I learned this as I became older in the Lord and started ministering more. There's people in this room that you have thought things and still tend to think things that you wish you didn't think. And the fact that you wish you didn't think them means it's not you. And you're still fighting over the fact that you're thinking it and thinking you got a problem and need help or healing or ministry when you ought to lift up your heart and rejoice your heart's been changed and you don't think the way you used to think and feel the way you used to feel and that you've been made pure and clean in His sight instead of feeling a little defiled or why is that still there? Why do I reminisce on that? It's flashbacks. Some of it's just the things that owned you before seeing if they still own you again. And even if you don't give yourself to them, they like to just violate your conscience. You ought to rejoice. If, they, if that makes you feel bad to have a flashback, a memory, and you're like, oh, I wish I didn't think that. Man, you ought to rejoice and just burst out in communion with God. And we're going to get on this, hopefully this week, real heavy on communion with God. Just rejoice and say, Father, you have so changed my heart. I am not the person I used to be. There was a time I used to think things degenerate and go after things of the flesh. But I love you and I want the things of the Spirit. You have made me a brand new person, purified me, cleansed me, and I am so clean in your sight. You talk like that after you just thought something derogatory and you just thought of something. You better, what else is there? Are you kidding me? Because my heart says, yeah. Or the devil's just playing us like a fiddle. And it's not a good tune. It's like, it's, just, it's not good. <laughs> let's change the music, huh? Come on. Okay, let's get back. We got to get to this. Man, where does time go? Help me, Jesus. I was trying to read Romans 6 and we didn't even get halfway through 5. <laughs> Why did I go to 5? I turned it to 6 and started reading out of 5. <sighs> Do you see 
Do you see why we read in 5? Because in verse 2, it tells you to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse 11, it says you rejoice because through Christ you've been reconciled. Now the question would be to the body of Christ, who has really taken the time to truly rejoice and stay in a place of good tidings and great joy because they've been made right with God? Sounds like that's a key, a foundational key, doesn't it? Honestly, I'm going to talk what I believe right now. It's just my belief. Honestly, I believe that we haven't established that is why people don't feel excited in the Lord. It turns into works. They backslide and do things that they used to do because they don't get established in the fact that I've been made friends. I've been reconciled. I'm right. You accept me right now. Standing in this room, you love to love me. People don't establish that. And then they don't walk in a reality and a revelation of God's love that literally, I believe, compels them through life. What compels you and drives the fuel in your tank is the love of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ compels me. This beautiful thing called God's love for me is what motivates me and fuels me in life. That's what he's saying. Compels. Moves me forward motors me along what motors you along Paul the love of God 2 Corinthians 5 why because I judge something I've looked and I've viewed something through the word that if one man died then we all died and now that one man lives and some of us live through him and if we who died now live through him we should no longer live for ourselves, but him that died and therefore see no man any longer for face value according to the flesh but for his potential and the reason this one died so the cross itself has totally changed Paul's perspective in the motivation of love that it's his compelling every day to live and you think this isn't some fresh big deal it is huge that's why you take weeks on this, this, this topic and never end and just keep going because it's something you keep alive every day. And you, it's, not a, 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 it's not just a school that you're going through to get a grade. Oh, I took that course. No, it's a life lesson. Yeah. Like, like, okay. Do you think that I'm really excited about what I'm telling you? Do you think I do that to keep your attention? Or do you think I'm really excited about what I'm telling you? Okay. Like a little bit, right? <laughs> Okay, now do you think that I just got saved yesterday? Okay, so it's been 16 years, but am I genuinely, do you think I'm really excited or do you think I'm trying to seem excited? Or do you think I'm really excited? Now watch. So this revelation isn't just fresh every day, it gets fresher. It's actually bigger. It's the same truth more revealed. We're so busy. It's, it's not, it's, it's, we're like, give me some new word, brother. I want a fresh word. No, become the word you've heard. I mean, yeah. serious. It's like, serious? Yeah. I want a fresh word, brother. I'm giving you a fresh word. <laughs> this morning is fresh mercy and fresh grace and fresh mercy this morning over your life. Psalm says, new mercy, yeah. new mercy. And new grace every day. It's fresh and new. His love is just shining on me. And I see it clearer. So it's the same truth, bigger. (laughs) Do you get it? (gasps) Hey, Destiny, on the way here, we were playing a song. I I ought to to bring it in and play it. It's, It's an identity song. It's a girl singing, she's holy, righteous, blameless. She's perfect in his sight. She's irreplaceable. And I'm like, oh. I said, I don't know if everybody can sing that song, but it would be good. And I said to Destiny, I said, I'm so cool singing that song. I said, I'm gonna, I could put on a little fairy costume and just dance in front of the church. <laughs> I said, better yet, get your daddy to do that. She said, oh my God. <laughs> I said, I could see him. I said, yeah. <laughs> Holy blameless. It's my little granddaughter's favorite song. When, when she gets in my truck, she, she loves getting in my truck because she wants to pop in that CD, Drive with Grandpa. And as soon as we get in the CD and I turn on, or get in the truck and I turn on, she reaches and she puts it on number two, no matter what CD's on. I say, honey, that's, that's not the CD. I know what you're doing, but that's the different CD, honey. 
She says, can you put that one in? She's five and a half. I said, you better believe I can. And she's like, she's like, she's bouncing. So I put it in and she can't wait to hit it to two. And then when she hits it to two, she sees two come on. She sits back and she waits for the identity thing to come on. Because I told her it's a little princess song. It's, it's how God sees her and it's what God's singing over her. And, it's, and I said, this girl on the song, she's believing it and she's singing it back. She's saying that's who she is to the Lord. She's precious and beautiful and holy and blameless. And, and, and you should see her. She's only five and a half. And she'll hit it. And as soon as it's over, she'll hit it right back to two again. And then she'll sit there. And then she'll look. She'll turn her head out this way, out the window, and she'll sing along. It's so fun. Because she's five and a half and she's seeing that that's the way to see that God sees. <laughs> and it helps her see what's wrong with me. <laughs> and <they're> on, yeah. <laughs> Look, she's so funny. She's Jenny's like, bring it in. We'll just start tomorrow like that. She's, <laughs> that's so cool. But it's, it's just really sweet because, and if, if Destiny, she could bring her fairy costume and dance in front of her. We're telling about the little identity song and singing and she said, I could definitely see you in front of the congregation doing that. <laughs> but uh, says that she's irreplaceable. It says in the song that she's the move of God prophesied. She's his kingdom come, his will be done. <laughs> Sweet little song, isn't it? Yeah. I've been, what do you mean you want to hear it? I've been singing the song to you. <laughs> All week, <laughs> all week, I've been singing the song. <laughs> Randy, we're a mess. Oh, where's time going? Oh, I'm having so much fun. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, so look, I'm not trying to be redundant. I want you to see that the Bible is believing and expecting God is pulling you in a position to where you're rejoicing in the fact that you're a friend to God you're made right to God I'm not, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse I'm, I'm, I'm proclaiming something that's very alive if, if, if I can't start with first things first and get rooted and grounded in love then I'll be a seed that's sown on rocky soil no depth of heart no depth of earth and you receive your answer immediately and you go oh I know that's yay and you leave church in the heat of the day comes the pressures of life and that thing that sprung up quick withers because there's no root no depth of soil that root is love God's unfailing love because you get out in the heat of the day and it's just self-conscious self-serving self-preserving well where was God I got that word I know that was for me how come God didn't why oh he ah no depth of soil, no root in them, because there's no root in them. Well, what are you rooted and grounded in? Love. So you're not going to let time, you're not going to let the two weeks, and you're not going to let the beans not cut in the two weeks. That, that's not going to happen now. It's not, you're not going to let a physical symptom, you're not going to, no, you're going to get more militant. When that thing's coming on you to suggest something else, you're actually more militant. Because you're, you're defending in your heart the truth that makes you free. You're saying, this has nothing to do with who I am. And it does not challenge God's love for me. His love shall never be challenged because Christ died and rose again. And you live in my spirit. You camp there till that gets big in you. You get it? I'll take you through a lot of stuff. I, I, I went and did a job. I did a job... Uh, when I was pastoring one time I stepped out went into this workplace and, and you couldn't miss no time and when they were they were, I had so many experiences in the workplaces over the years I, I actually liked being around folks and I used to I had people that were pushing to get in the position I was in in, in the office and ministry and they just thought they could get in full time ministry their ships come in or something and I'm thinking here I was I had friends saying you seem discontent you know here you are full time in ministry salary oh my gosh and I'm thinking yeah everything is Christian 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 and Christian language and some people were, weren't even necessarily living Christian would talk Christian because they're talking to me and it was just Christian Christian and I'm like I don't know I just want to go to work and be around people yeah. and people were like well I wish I was in and here you are you're, it's like you want to be out there and I want to be in here and I'm like oh. <laughs> so but I was at work and they said you can't miss on my orientation you can't miss any time in your 90 day uh, probation or you lose your job and I'm 
And they said, so we, you know, and I know they're saying it's flu season and da, 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 but we can't. If, if you're sick in this 90 period and you miss work, we'll see you as a liability and da, da, da. So they're, they're just making sure people come to work, even if they're sick. And I'm thinking in my mind, it wasn't a haughty thing. I thought, well, that's not going to be an issue because I honestly, I honestly don't get sick. I've, I've never had the flu in 16 years. I don't get head colds. I don't get nothing. And don't expect to. It's not the common cold. There's nothing common about me. <laughs> so if it's, it, well, yeah, but brother, you know it's really going around. What does that mean? What do you mean it's really going around? So that's what we say. Well, you know, I got that. It's really going around. There's a mentality that embraces things and gets embraced by things. We don't realize how subtle it is. And that's not some arrogant, high-ho thing I'm preaching to you right now. What I'm saying is I've been through some trials. I've had some things. I had my head hurting so bad for two weeks in a row, once a day, it would hit me and I couldn't hardly see and the pain was unbearable. And when you go through that for two weeks, after the first three days and you start feeling it come, you know it's coming. And you're, 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 you know, Father, I just thank you, but it's coming. And it's already hurt you for three days. So now your flesh is going, oh no. Not again. That's the temptation, right? I can't take this anymore. No, this, man, you know, I come across a certain way, but I'm more of a warrior than you probably realize. I don't love my own life unto death. I, I don't believe I do. And I'm just not afraid of the war. I'm just not. I'm a peacemaking, loving guy. I'll love you all day long. But you're not the devil. I'm not afraid of the war. You get what I'm saying? See, I feel that all over me when I'm talking. It's like, ah! This thing's hitting me two weeks in a row. You know, I all thought something's wrong, brain tumor, something's bad. I mean, it would come. And, and then it hit me twice in a day. Which just seemed... And... The, the time it hit me twice in a day, it hit me in the evening and I was at home. My wife's watching me suffer. You have no idea. I would be like, Jesus, Lord Jesus. <sighs> uh, you have no idea how ugly it was. It was so much pain. This was, I went through three things of witchcraft and then this thing hit me years later. This was just seven years, six, seven years ago. I can't tell you how bad it was. Sometimes things look for an opportune time. They come try to get you in a certain place, get you to say, well, I know I shouldn't have it. I had victory over it. I don't know why. All that crazy stuff. I don't do that. My mind is so gripped here, I don't even wander nowhere. I ain't even asking the questions and I ain't even thinking of answers. Now's not the time to grope and grab. Now's the time to be in Him. If I'm searching here and here, I'm not fighting the good fight of faith. That's for sure. And if I got all these questions, I'm sure letting everybody know I'm not sure whether I'm coming or going. No, the reality is I had serious pain in my head once a day for two weeks. But the truth is, Jesus is Lord and we're going to win and this thing is not changing nothing. So my wife, she's feeling really sympathetic for me and that's not a terrible word. She's just feeling bad for me. If you saw him really hurting bad, your heart would cry for him. You'd be like, oh my gosh, because you feel for him, because you're one with him. And it would be like, that, was a hard, that would be a hard thing, because you love him, right? Like, it's just the suggestions getting her emotional. <laughs> you're amazing. <laughs> she was like, man, I thought she was going to hold him or something. <laughs> she just seems to, she, I was so good. I just feel like, <laughs> down hairs, down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so my wife, I mean, it's three in the morning or something like that. She hears me staggering through the house moaning. And she comes into the kitchen and I'm leaning over the sink holding my head. I can't even stand up. I'm just moaning. But here's the cool thing. My heart is so alive and okay and at peace. Can't explain it. I've been in it before. I'm not a wreck. I'm not thinking, oh, I can't take this. When is this going to stop? Why does this? Because that's just me, 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 me. And I'm saying, punch me, it hurts. Come on, it's our language. Why do I got to go through this? I hate this. Why am I going to, oh my God, I don't want to go through this no more. And it's just, it begins to be a complaining thing and it makes rational sense, but you're just saying, punch me, it hurts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a place where as much as it hurt, it didn't have any capacity to touch my heart whatsoever. My heart is so separate from what I'm feeling because of building myself in this gospel. It's a militant thing. It's like a boot camp idea. It's just trained in the gospel. Amen. Yeah, you don't wait for war to train, you train. And when war comes, you're ready. 
you hit that? Come on, if we waited for war, we'd lose for sure. Rachel. It's there, I don't even have to guard my heart in this area. It's, it's an established precept. But there's a guarding your heart with truth, of course. There's a guarding your heart if you get tempted with... Diff- we all have the ability to think things negative, think things contrary to truth, even though our hearts are sincere and there's things established. So guarding your heart is just keeping sure your heart's in agreement with truth and not letting any rightness come in to give you permission to be less than who he is. So that's a good thing. She said, is that not like you don't have to guard your heart? It's just already there. In this area, yeah, Rachel, that wasn't a... I didn't have to do a conscious protect my heart thing because you can get established in truth. You see what I'm saying? But guarding your heart is, okay, out of the blue, somebody does something totally unexpected. And, 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 and all of a sudden you say, I can't believe they did that. And you start thinking on it way deeper than you're even to consider. And I can't believe they did that. And after all they said, now you remember on promise and now it's broken. And oh my God, next thing you know, you don't know who you can trust because if I couldn't trust them, I couldn't trust everybody. <laughs> That is not guarding your heart. <laughs> that is running your mind <laughs> to the detriment of your life and everybody around you. <laughs> and now you have 10 reasons why you're hurt. <laughs> Serious. But no, in this situation, I'm, laying, I'm leaning over the sink. It's so fun for me. <clears throat> I'm leaning over the sink of my, my wife. She, she flips the little light on and she says, Honey, oh my gosh. And she wants to cry. She's rubbing my shoulder. And I'm just... I'm in trouble, it seems, to her eyes. To the flesh, it probably looked like I was in serious trouble. People that love you don't do well in those situations because we're more sentimental than spirit-filled lead. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying, we're like, oh no. So she says, honey, she says, what is going on? How long is this going to keep happening? I can't stand watching you. You're in so much pain. How long is this going to happen? I don't remember the quote, but just the concept. I remember chuckling, chuckling out of my heart, chuckling. Oh, I was in so much pain, it was ridiculous. (laughs) But out of my heart, chuckling, and I said, don't you understand, sweetheart, that's not the question. It's not about how long and how long is this going to happen. It's not about that. It's about who I am and who I am in him. It's about that not ever being able to change. And that's what wins. My life is not my own. And you just can't hurt me or touch me or something like that. And I sat up saying that. And when I said that, it was like, that was the victory. That was the whole concept. Satan was trying to get me off of that. And I can't come off of that. It's not about, yeah, but if you were in faith, then why are you hurting? It's always about the soup. The, 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 the superficial idea of, of just the natural what we're, yeah but we're always caught up with the pain but then why two weeks well how come well why isn't God delivering well there has to be a stronghold well there has to be a root well there has to be wonder if in this process God is cultivating and growing something in me and, and, and revealing like through fire precious gold that's proved and tested to the praise and honor of glory of Jesus Christ at the revelation of him wonder if the trial is perfecting something and God's not even backing off the trial he's just sitting there watching me do what he's put me in position to do and come out with a greater revelation than I ever had before when I said that about it's, it's about who I am and I sat up I remember the pain started backing off and this boldness and this like a fire came up my belly it happened the one time with the witchcraft when I went ballistic and I said don't you realize Kimmy this whole thing makes me untouchable it's not about me being touched it makes me untouchable and I started to proclaim truth and it was like an explosion it was like somebody put a stick of dynamite in my ear went and I'm telling you that thing blasted out of me I was so crystal clear I didn't feel like I had hurt even one day I was so full of the spirit of God and so sure that he was Lord and that my life is his I was like a madman and it was like that thing took me to a, some of the stuff you see come on me when I'm preaching the pattern, it's because of all those things see if you if, see you can tell people have been through fire when there's that passion in their eye when, when you can hear it's coming out of their heart because they know it I'm not preaching philosophy to you I'm not preaching a theory it's what I've become it's what I've lived I've tasted and seen he's so good doesn't matter that my head was hurting who 
cares that my head hurt for two weeks? Why is that the principal thing? I'm raising my voice on a purpose to stop everything else and make a point here. Do you get it? Who cares that I hurt for two weeks? It took me to a great thing. Is that giving myself permission to be pummeled? No. It's not making big what's not big. It's, making not, it's not letting get so big what's not really the issue. Yeah, right. The pain in my head wasn't the issue. What it was going after is the issue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amen. What it was trying to uproot is the issue. But if we're so self-serving and self-loving and self-imposed, and self, the pain matters so much. It isn't about the pain two weeks into it. It's about the principle of the thing and what this thing is after and what you have no permission to get from me because it came from him. And I'm going to hold on. Even if I die, I can't die. (laughs) Do you get what I'm saying? You get to get that militant. Now that's militant. And that's not afraid then. And it's never about your pain. It's about your heart. When I had that witchcraft thing, I'm telling you, that thing was real and it felt like I was dying and I was so not even moved by that I was so like it isn't even about death ever to my family they're watching me pass out and lay out on the floor you know what my wife was hearing in her head Dan or Kim your husband Dan is so bullheaded and stubborn that he'll lay here and die in front of you and the kids before he goes and gets help that's what she was hearing (laughs) what a lying little devil that doesn't know a thing (laughs) for one thing I didn't lay there and die here I am preaching to you yay (laughs) I knew it was witchcraft I didn't need 911. I knew it was witchcraft. The Lord showed me what it was. There was stuff going on. It was witchcraft. I don't need anything but Jesus. You could say, well, diabetes is witchcraft. Don't take your insulin. No, see, if, there's, if, there, if you're taking something and you're in faith and you're, but you're separating yourself from that and you're growing in identity and walking in healing, that's great. But when I know it's a demon spirit, grabbing me doing something and they can't even physically identify it and it's demonic I don't need 911 mm-hmm. I have everything I need so I just stood my ground and I, and, and I had every Christian telling me I was in spiritual pride I had, I had no one in my life understood and locked arms with me which is okay but isn't it amazing how many responses we have yeah. <laughs> without the truth my heart got imposed on so many times well you're just in spiritual pride you're ashamed to go to the doctor because you preach so passionate and so unlimited that if you go to the doctor you don't want that on your resume and you just don't know how to preach through that experience and I never even thought of any of that stuff but everybody else was thinking that stuff I'm like what? (laughs) wasn't in my heart until now now I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking now that's silly no my simple thought was this is the devil Jesus already won. Let me fight the good fight and we'll win. That was just simple to me. Leave it at that. This is the devil. Jesus is Lord and I'm in him. We'll win. Yeah, I know it looks ugly. It doesn't matter. It's not always pretty. But it is in the end. You come out with more knowing than before. It's not pretty all the time. If you get your eyes on that, if you get your eyes on the garden and the beans that aren't sprouting, it's not always pretty. It's not what you envisioned. And you go through a season where you can't see what you see. That's what makes it faith. You follow me? That day that I was laying there, felt like I was dying. You know what went through my head? Dan, you're such a great believer. You're such a noble man. You really do live this gospel. It sounded like I was getting a pat on the back. But you do not have to suffer like this. Enough is enough. You don't need this kind of pain. 
It doesn't change anything if you go get help. You can just go get help. It started to begin to be a doctor thing and a hospital thing and all the things the people were saying. It started to be, and my wife, he's going to die in front of you and the kids if he doesn't get help. Now that voice wasn't applauding me like it was me, so it probably wasn't God, huh? So it's playing on the emotion of my wife. Your husband's so bullheaded and stubborn, he's going to die in front of you. So it's a self-serving thought. Full of sentiment that the, almost the whole world and three quarters of the church would back up. <laughs> Over on my end, I'm hearing, oh, you're such a great believer, man. You got nothing to lose. Look, you already went farther than most. Come on, just go get some. You don't need this kind of pain. Nobody wants you hurting like this. It felt so good to my flesh hearing that. You have no idea. When I heard that, I thought, yeah, yeah, no pain. Yeah. I was, I was hurting so bad you have no idea and to my mind and flesh I was like oh give me something anything whatever and I'm thinking that for a minute like oh but not that I wanted to I'm just thinking no pain yeah and, and I thought you know what I do I know, I, I've hurt so bad I'm going to pass out in front of her they're going through so I need to go get help and I looked at my wife she's looking at me with these big brown eyes thinking what she's thinking I'm going to die and I, and I went to say Kim maybe we ought to just go get some help I was going to say it out of my mouth. It's the first time in my life that I understood what it means that God won't allow you to be tempted more than you can bear. I've never totally understood what that scripture means. But for you, I'll always provide a way of escape. Do you know where it says that in the Bible? I was beyond what I could bear. My flesh, who knows that your flesh has feelings and it's real. And when you're in that kind of pain and you're ready to pass out, you're in more pain than you think you could ever tolerate and endure. And I was going through so much that I couldn't put it into words. I had kidney stone years ago and I thought that was bad they say that's the closest a man will ever feel like to child labor for a woman the kidney stones and I'm thinking God I'm glad I'm a guy <laughs> and not a woman with five kids because if I had to go through that every time I'd be like because serious in, in my flesh I'm thinking this hurts well this pain so blew kidney stone out of the water it was ridiculous it, it wasn't even a comparison and uh, it was like taking my vision my consciousness my kids and wife found me. I was dragging through the house because I'm a warrior. I'm a fighter. I was holding on to a railing upstairs. I was going, as the deer path for the water. That's what they said I was doing. I don't know what I do. <laughs> and they surrounded me and prayed in tongues and prayed for me crying and it seemed to get worse. Who's ever had that happen? Yeah. And your mind really goes, huh? So I'm laying there and this voice says this. And I was ready to say, let's go get help. And when I went to say, maybe we need to just go get some help and get rid of this pain for now. Give me, I can't. I gotta get rid of this pain. When I went to speak, I couldn't say it. There was something inside of me that said, that isn't what I've been standing for. That's not my answer. That's not what you locked into, Dan. And I hesitated just for a moment and didn't say that. And in that little moment, I heard this small, still whisper of a voice down inside. And here's what it said. Don't believe the lie. I'd never experienced anything like this at the time. But I sat up and consciousness came on me. It was sovereign. It was the Spirit of God because I passed this thing I jumped this hurdle somehow I had held on and God saw me as a warrior he was like faith is taking you you crossed this line because I, I didn't give up my identity I held on to the point of literally death and this revelation came I sat up I don't know how all that works but I know we co-labor with him I know we work out our salvation with fear and trembling I know we follow the finished work of Jesus lay a foundation and we never look back that's what I was in the process of. I set up and I said out loud. When you hear Holy Spirit, it's good to say what he says. He said, don't believe the lie. I sat up and I said, I will not believe the lie. Now I had strength in my voice. Well, I couldn't even lift my arm. My arm, what well, was this arm? I couldn't even lift my arm. My arm was so in so much pain in my body that I couldn't even move my arm. Guys, this thing was so intense that I had my kids. I got this bright idea that if my kids would raise my hand like they did Moses's in the battle that we would win it's works it sounded cool and prophetic <laughs> cost my poor kids big time they were like uh, 12 and 7 
And I'm screaming at them passionately to lift my hand. And when they move my hand four inches, I'm screaming like they're killing me. And they don't want to hurt daddy anymore. And I'm saying, it's okay, lift it. Ah! Ah! You have no idea. It was so dramatic. Ah! And they're like, daddy! I said, it's okay. Jesus is Lord. Lift my arm, kids. And they got my arm up high. And I said, yes. And I lift my arm and said, it's not works. I said, ah! Oh. Even as Moses in the battle and Aaron and her lifted his hands, God, I will worship you. It sounds so noble. It's, you'd think God would just come and say, ha, oh, good boy. <laughs> but it's not what I do. And my kids are bawling and they got my arm up and they're bawling. My kids are bawling because they feel like they're helping kill daddy. That's how militant I am and passionate. See, you might not even be ready for that behind the scenes. Telling my kids, get my arm up. Now they have to put it back down. And I didn't think it could hurt worse, but when they put it down, and it, then it was even worse. And that's when it led to this whole thing. But I set up, I said, I won't believe the lie. And uh, I stood to my feet. It was pretty overwhelming. And all of a sudden, my arms that I couldn't even lift were up high. I can't explain the fire that came into my stomach. You know, we talk about the belly and fire in the belly. Oh, it was fire. It was holy and it was powerful. It came in me. I felt like a lion. I felt undefeatable, invincible. I must have felt a glimmer of what God lives in every day. He's almighty God. <laughs> he fears nothing. And yet he's perfect love. He's not some arrogant, power surging, need of attention. He's not weird and twisted. He's all powerful and perfect love. Oh, what a blend. That's my dad. My dad is all powerful and perfect love. <laughs> so I got this fire thing on me. I got this, this, and this is all feelings. This is all ministrations of spirit. So I'm very aware of them, had my share of them. Believe me, over the years, I just don't talk a lot about this stuff, but this is what happened to me. I, but see, what took me there wasn't praying for a breakthrough, believing I already had one. The stone's already rolled away. Yes. And the breakthrough for me is not loving my own life unto death. And it's not about the pain. It's about the glory of the cross. And the integrity of the gospel. <laughs> I stood up and said, I will not believe the lie. And I stood up and I raised my hands real high. And I started to speak into the realm of spirit. Because I knew this witchcraft thing had been tracking me. Trying to get me whatever it tries to get you. Like this. What's next. Scared of it. I yelled out of my spirit. And I don't talk like this. This isn't my way of talking. I, kn I know it was just I got overtaken. It's the time I told you earlier. If there was any time I ever had wished I had on tape, it was these next 10 minutes. That's when the crystal waterfall, this is the time when the ceiling opened and the water poured on me. But I said this out of my mouth. I said, I, I had my eyes wide open, my hands raised. And I'm like, I, mean, I can't even tell you. I felt like a warrior. I felt absolutely invincible. And I yelled and I said, how long will you like an uncircumcised Philistine. I didn't know who I was talking to, but I knew I was talking to something. I said, how long will you, you uncircumcised Philistine, stand in the field of my life and hurl threats at a child of the living God? And when I said that, there was this spiritual explosion I can't explain. And my body was so invigorated. I mean, they show commercials drinking Gatorade and getting revitalized. <laughs> If they could bottle this stuff. <laughs> so in this waterfall, I mean, if I could have just had some bottles. <laughs> just, just standing there and, and I had my eyes open and that's when I looked up and that's this waterfall came on me. It was just ridiculously amazing because God is my father. And when I stood off the floor, that's when I preached the revelation of Christ. But I addressed that thing. How long will you Stand in the field of my life and hurl threats. Every assault to your life is a threat. It's saying you're not who you say you are. You'll never be who you say you are. The gospel's not true. Every adversity to your life is suggesting something contrary to truth. And believing you'll take it personal and bite the bait through lack of knowledge. Every assault has that attached to it. But every assault by God is designed to take you to a higher place and be more like Christ than you've ever been in your life. So your trouble is not your trouble. 
He said, I'll be with you. Pastor Don preached the other week. So I'll be with him in time of trouble. It didn't say I'll keep him from trouble. I'll be with him in trouble. What's changing just because my head's hurting? What's changed? Is the stone still rolled away? Is Christ still mediating? Is the Spirit of God still in me? Then that's my battle point. And if I let those things change who I am, I won't walk in the glory of what He's accomplished. That's why the just live by. And if you don't settle first. See how this all ties up? Right at quick time. Watch. If you don't rejoice in the fact. And get established in the fact. That you've been reconciled. You'll let all these things question. Where that reconciliation even is. You follow me? And you'll compare this to this. That's already done. That's why I'm taking so much time. On some of these topics. So that we're rooted. Grounded in love. So that you can never change your mind come hell or high water. Because <sighs> whether I see this thing or not in my ceiling, it's flowing. Yeah. I found it in my Bible. It's a crystal river. <laughs> it's flowing. There's trees along it. Their leaf will never wither and they bear fruit. And the healing of the nations is on those trees. <laughs> Must be us. <laughs> you get it? It's a crystal river. It flows from the threshold of the temple. Yeah, and guess where he lives now? Guess who the temple of God is now? Guess where the river flows from? Out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. <laughs> so there's like crystal rivers, crystal rivers. <laughs> Man, it doesn't even make us flaky believe in that. It's just crystal rivers. <laughs> real spirit of God the glory of God and goodness of God amen I didn't touch nothing today <laughs> but I was gonna so I know we can go back tomorrow and pick up somewhere this is school Romans 6 and we didn't read any of that you know what's cool serious you hear me say it all the time tomorrow when we open our Bibles Romans 6 will be there and you know what else is cool? It'll say the same thing tomorrow that it said today. There's a truth to that. He doesn't change, does he? So that's not change. If he doesn't change, why do we? With every wind and trial. In fact, in fact, in fact, let me just read this quick. I got 30 seconds. Yeah. Verse 12 of Ephesians 4. Watch this. Well, verse 11. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? So we build a conference around them to minister to us? Not against conferences, but they have to have a purpose of equipping, right? Not just ministry. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the... So the saints are in the work of the ministry. For the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Watch. So these gifts are in the body to build up the body for who she is till we all. How many? All. The unity of faith till we see through the same eye and understand these things. The unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. A complete man. Oh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the anointing available through Christ. And watch. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by things. Mindsets, winds of doctrine. Come on, this is not the Christian life. The day of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. We grow from faith to faith and glory to glory. We ascend into Him. We grow up into Him in all things. This is not the normal Christian life. Right? Watch. So we're no longer tossed by trickery, man, cunning, crafty, deceitful. There's a whole lot of things you can attach to that and take time to teach about that. Motives of men. Sometimes it's protecting their own past scenarios, a heritage, their own experience. And sometimes people get on a, a dogma of doctrine because it protects their go through. And then they're trying to get the whole world to agree with what they've been through. And, and it, it's, it's, it's terrible. There's some people that have so much hurt in their life. And they're, they're so offended at loss and things that they can't even hear the gospel clearly preached. Because they're protecting their heart and their loss. And they're not protecting anything. They're actually hurting and mad. And they need love to minister to. You see what I mean? You don't realize how tr tr 
how that's traps. But look, verse 15. We're going to speak the truth in what? Not rightness. Not just to be right, but in love. I'm telling you, it goes a long way. We're going to speak the truth in love. love. There's a young lady sitting here. I don't want to embarrass her and spoil her, but she, I got to love on her one day and we prayed and talked and I said things and things. That, but she said for the first time ever, things got real clear. She believed and was able to see what was always there. Right? But it came that day. It doesn't surprise me. I hear that testimony all the time. Because I'm not giving you doctrine. I'm giving you what's a revelation to me. So when I'm, she's waiting around for an hour after the service and I'm talking to her, she's hanging around and just wants to talk and wants prayer. And I go to pray for her. Who knows I'm not just doing the Christian thing to do. That's my responsibility. There'd be a good Rachel steward of your heart thought. That's another good way to guard your heart and be a good steward of your heart. Guard your heart and make sure your motives are always pure and life-giving. You don't just do things rhetorical. So when I'm talking to her and praying for her, I know she has destiny. I know she's worth the blood. I know that she's the will of God. I know all that. So it's fun to pray for her. But because I'm praying from that place, it carries a grace and anointing and a revelation that, boom, releases something in her that she hadn't seen before. And changed everything since then. Isn't that cool? Look at her smile. You can tell the light's just on. I like just looking at her. She's just... <laughs> You're a light bulb. So, so we're going to speak the truth in love. Why? So we can grow up in what? In all things. Into Him who is the head. So we're going to speak the truth in love to grow up into what? All things. In Him. Amen? That's why we're in the school. You guys all right? You doing good? You okay with this way that I am? Because if you're not, you'll have to drop out of the school. Because <laughs> I can't change. <laughs> so you'll just have to go. <laughs> we'll have who we have. Can we pray? Why don't we stand to our feet? And let's just bless the Lord and thank Him for goodness. Sorry I got late there five minutes. Stand to our feet. Let's just, let's just bless. Let's just pray. Hey, Brian. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not putting you on the spot. But I need you to come up here. I want you to pray over the class and just bless the class. Yep, I just heard that in my heart. Now I'm going to obey it. I believe it was God. I believe it was. You can just hold that to your mouth. And then uh, if you get wild Pentecostal and radical, you know, we'll just go up and do you think I will? <laughs> you just, you just, I got to wear this on Saturday There's something night. good about you uh, just oh. closing this. Yeah, I just heard that in my heart. I, I saw you. Actually, I wasn't even looking at you. I saw your face. That's good. Yeah, it's just blessed. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for what you see in us, God. I thank you for that thing, God, that's so deposited deep within us. That deep that's calling out to deep right now. I thank you, Father, for the revelatory truth. Come on, that's setting people free, God. That if you do continue in my word, and I said this the other day when I was here on Saturday, it doesn't say words if you continue in my word, because do not separate what he did from what he said. If you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Father, I thank you that Jesus' entire ministry was hell bent on our freedom to know the Father. I thank you, Father, that, that you sent your Son for that purpose so we can know Daddy and come to know ourselves. From the beginning of time, Father, you showed me that even by the works of your hands, Romans one twenty, it was all about knowing you. The law, the prophets, Jesus, Holy Spirit, and here's the kicker, guys, now you. Thank you, Father, for, as Dan was saying, putting your spirit back in us to manifest the truth. Father, I just, as Dan said, God, I bless this class. I bless the journey each and every person is on. I thank you that it was for freedom's sake that Christ came to get us free for the sole purpose of of knowing you because in this is eternal life John 17 3 
It's knowing you to look like you. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you, Father. This is so clear in my heart, God. You showed it to me. God, that, that, that you are... <laughs> Some, it may offend some people that you're evangelizing your bride. You keep telling me that yeah. over and over and over again. And that people are being born again. Uh, in fact, I'll share that with you with my eyes closed. The, the, I shared this on Saturday night, two Saturdays ago. The Lord showed me my three-year-old daughter crawling back up into my, my wife's womb to be reborn again. And, uh, and I shared it with a brother of mine, a friend of mine. And, and he says, well, God said to my spirit, he said, uh, the church has really birthed some misfits and some, some children that didn't know who they are, but he's bringing them back mm -hmm. to be born again as sons and daughters. Thank you, Father. We do bless your name, Holy Spirit. We bless, we bless you, God. I bless this class, Father. I do. I ask and pray that they continue to grow in the knowledge, Lord, of the love that you have for him. And, and this was in my spirit as, as Dan was sharing Second Corinthians five fourteen through 21. Essentially, God, you said to me, that's the ministry, Brian, of the saints. That's it. That's the key. And my Bible says, the love of Christ controls me. And Paul got it and he stayed there. Like Dan said, he understood that one died for all, therefore all died. And that chapter ends with he who knew no sin became sin on my behalf so that I might become the righteousness of God in him. And like we said last week, you're already clean because the word I have spoken to you. And if he said it, it's a done deal. Make that explode in the depths of our spirits, God. Make that such a reality, God. Make that so clear. Make that be the only eye we see through. The only eye. So that when life does squeeze, like Dan says, Christ comes out. So we just say thank you for this school. We say thank you for Dan. We say thank you, God, for the work of God in his life, what you continue to do through him and what you're doing in each and every one of us, and that through your Son, you said, you're worthy. Thank you, Father, for abolishing the lie and allowing truth, Father, to finally be established. In Jesus' name, your mighty name, amen. I want everybody to participate. This is sound controlling, but I want you to do this. Put your hands up. I want you to say this out loud. Everybody in this room.